Chapter Twenty One of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Herbert Carrington. Chapter Twenty One. Inspirational Speaking and Test Messages Inspirational speaking depends partly upon the activity of your own subconscious mind and partly upon the amount of help you receive from the spirit world. In speaking before public audiences, for the first few times, you had best think over what you are to say and prepare your talk a little in advance. Then, depend upon the help and inspiration you receive from the elaboration of these notes which you have made. As you progress, you will find that less and less of this preparation is necessary, and after a time, you will be enabled to dispense with it altogether, and know nothing more of the subject of your discourse than the mere title. On the Rostrum When on the Rostrum, you can close your eyes, and the discourse, more or less eloquent, will flow from your lips. When you are still more advanced, you will be enabled to allow persons in the audience to choose subjects and you will then be able to talk upon these at great length and often with profundity of knowledge and beauty of style which surprises not only yourself but your auditors many of the best and most profound object lessons and instructions have been received in this manner and much of the philosophy of spiritualism has been propounded and explained in this way test messages are of somewhat different order and are given in a different manner. They relate to persons in the audiences or to objects brought by those persons and the information concerns not an abstract subject or theme but individuals connected with the person to whom the message is given. It concerns spiritual personalities more directly than spiritual truth and though both may have their origin in friendly helpers, they are nevertheless given for different purposes and in a different manner how to begin a very good way to begin training both for inspirational speaking and test messages is the following which dr r r schlesner an able trance and test medium personally followed in his development and which he found gave most satisfactory results in writing of this dr schlesner says first of all I asked someone in the audience to speak to me a set or formal sentence such as Doctor help me or Doctor reach me. From this I received certain impressions which I analyzed somewhat as follows. 1. I can tell from the sound of the voice whether it is harsh and grating or whether it is soft, gentle and harmonious and from this the character of the speaker may be more or less diagnosed. Also, the voice will tell me whether the person is nervous and irritable or self-contained and controlled, whether the person is angry or is skeptical and merely asking for a test. Further, the voice will tell me whether the person is weak or strong, positive or negative, sensitive or the reverse. These are the physical properties of the voice, so to speak, and from them I gather certain information more or less instantaneously and subconsciously as to the sitter and his attitude. Colors and Auras 2. In addition to this, I receive in connection with his voice certain psychic impressions. These take the form of auras or colors drawn up in a cloudly pillar-like forms. These colors I interpret symbolically. Thus, if I see before me a dirty slate gray, I say that the conditions before me are at present very unfavorable and depressing and if beyond this i see a yellowish gold rim i say that the immediate future prospects will be much brighter and better and that the person in question may cheer up as better conditions are coming etc besides this color which is drawn up before me in this form as the result of the physical vibration of the voice and which seems to be caused by it i always see another series of colors and auras in particular place some distance from the first space which i compare with the former set and see whether or not they agree 
after seeing the first set of colors i close my eyes for a moment then open them and look at the second set if they are found to agree with one another i know that my first impressions are correct and then i state openly that such and such conditions are so my own experience has been that if these two sets of auras agree with one another the diagnosis of psychic impression is correct and i am very seldom wrong in my statement of the fact their interpretation let us go back for a moment to the impression received by a heavy laden gray color suppose this is the color seen this indicates depression having arrived thus far the question is how to get out of this condition that is suggested partly by common sense having proposed this question to myself i close my eyes and look at a different place in space in this third place i then see presented to my psychic sight a symbol this symbol tells me how to escape from the present difficulty after i explained the symbol and interpreted it to the best of my ability i then look back at the colors see whether or not they have changed if they have become brighter then i know that this is the correct path to follow and that good will result from the course of action advised if there is no change i state that the things will continue for some time to come in this depressed condition and that the best that can be done for the time being is to hope and work on patiently how to increase your power these auras colors and symbols may be impeded and shut off by certain psychic conditions on the part of sensitivity for example you may hold on to them too tightly as it were and this tenacious grasp for too long a time will have a effect of shutting them off altogether you must learn to let go as soon as the symbol has been perceived or the color seen as these colors are presented to you you may however see a change going on and in that case you should also watch it intently and see that what the change may be thus gray may change to white a sign of spirituality and you can state that the person is becoming more spiritual and changing his point of view in life clinging to his ideals etc and that if he continues to do so success will reward him if you see tinges of gold and yellow you may be sure that the individual in question is cultivating his intellect and that he is independent in thought and a more or less clever intellectual person getting help from spirit guides in addition to these colors and symbols other phenomena may occur thus in my own case i always see my guides who stand by my side telling me what to say if i speak aloud just what they tell me it is usually correct if i endeavor to elaborate or extend it it is often wrong this is an error which should be avoided thus they may say 3 this may mean 3 minutes 3 hours 3 days 3 weeks 3 months 3 years etc at the time i hear the figure i do not know what its meaning is i therefore say to the person receiving the message my guide says to me 3 and then i wait for further information as explained in the lesson on symbolism the difference between the two consists in distinction between impression and expression i receive the impression correctly but must be careful not to give it wrong expression what one should do therefore is to wait for further impressions before expressing anything in such a case as the above i would after hearing the word three spoken turn to my guide and ask what the three signified on receiving an answer i would state this also and then go back to the information etc if you proceed in this manner you will rarely go wrong the more anxious you are to receive psychic impressions and to give tests the more fluctuating or changing will your impressions be the colors of the auras will keep changing and often you will see them constantly varying around any object placed on your table whereas if you are in a calmer frame of mind these colors would appear stationary endeavor therefore in every way possible to control your apprehension and anxiety in giving public tests of this nature important rules to follow one very good method in giving tests to the public is to endeavor to force your clairvoyant perception before asking aid of your spirit friends thus suppose some member of the audience asks the question how was my mother instead of waiting for the direct impression in this case 
I would say in reply to this, I will first try to find your mother and describe her. If I can do this, I will proceed with the test. This is far more satisfactory both to the speaker and to yourself. I now force myself, so to speak, clairvoyantly, and generally, in few moments the form of a lady arises before me, which I describe to the speaker in as much detail as possible, giving also her surroundings and the description of any other persons I see with her at the time. If this description is incorrect and not recognized, I then ask whether the description suits any other person known to the speaker, any person through whom the mother might be reached. If they reply in affirmative, I then endeavour to find the mother clairvoyantly and, if I cannot do this, I ask my guides to give me any information they can regarding her, without this vision. If, on the other hand, the test is not recognised, I drop it and proceed to another case, as I know that I can get nothing definite for this individual. Instances of this character are, however, very rare amounting probably to not more than five per cent of the tests I give in the public. How to receive impressions In all inspirational and test messages, you should throw yourself as completely as possible upon your spirit friends after you have once asked their assistance and should be as responsive as you can. Do not wait for them to hammer any impression into your head before you state what it is but hold yourself rather in the attitude of an empty vessel and imagine a funnel in the top of your head into which ideas and impressions of all kinds are being poured. As they enter your mental and psychic life, you should interpret and express them as best as you can. The foregoing is an exact account of Dr. Schlusner's method of delivering public tests and a careful study of which will doubtless prove helpful to the earnest student and I believe will result in a corresponding degree of development in all like cases. End of chapter 21 Recording by Lambda Chapter 22 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Sheeler. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Herward Carrington. Chapter 22. More and Less Developed Spirits. Inasmuch as we are said to be spirits here and now, just as much as we ever will be, we should begin the course of progressive development here in this life, which we intend to follow later. Anything we learn here will doubtless help us in any future development, whatever that may be. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, sympathy, and penetration of perception will all help, assist, and advance us, no matter what world we may inhabit, or whatever its nature may be. This being the case, we should endeavor to develop our own inner nature here and now, as suggested especially in the chapter on self and soul culture. And we should continue this so far as lies within our power even after we have crossed the Great Divide. Why Strangers Often Communicate Just as there are all kinds of characters and natures in this life, so there are said to be individuals of all kinds in the next. And the unfortunate part of it is that many of those who can most easily come back and communicate are those on the lowest rung of the ladder, those who are the most earthbound and belong to the lowest strata of society. They are nearer the earth than more advanced spirits, more in sympathy with it and its vibrations, and their character being more earthly is naturally more open to receive and send messages than those who, when alive, had less sympathy with the earth 
and felt less bound to it. It is for this reason that strangers often communicate with us more easily than our nearest and dearest, than our friends or relatives. The latter may feel for and with us most keenly and may long to communicate, but often obstacles hitherto undreamed of may prevent them from doing so. They then find for the first time and to their astonishment that the difficulties of communication are so great that they are unable to send messages however much they may desire to do so, and even if they can find a medium suitable to receive them. The Conditions for Communication You on your side may be receptive to these conditions, and again you may be unfitted to sense anything of the kind. The combination of circumstances for the transmission of spirit messages is rare, and in order for these messages to be clear, as we should desire them, there must be an effort both on this side and on the other, made at the same moment. Also, there must be the medium. As this combination is naturally lacking in the majority of cases, you can see why it is that authentic cases of spirit return are, comparatively speaking, so rare, and why it is that more persons do not come back. No doubt you have often heard the objection that if spiritualism were true, out of all the millions of people who have died wishing to communicate, there must be many thousands who could return directly and state clearly what they wish to send. What we have said above will explain the reason why this is not the case. The ability to transmit a message from the other side may be as rare as the ability to receive it on this side. Good communicators may be as rare as good artists, painters, or sculptors. It may be a special faculty which we have to develop, and just as uneducated and ignorant persons often possess extraordinary gifts and talents in certain directions, for no reason we can see, just so certain individuals may become good mediums or communicators after they have passed over, simply by reason of their psychic constitution or makeup. The question of the difficulties of communication will be found fully discussed in Chapter 24. Why Low or Evil Spirits Communicate it is because of all this that we often reach or come into contact with persons of a low order in spirit communications. Mediums believe that there are tramps and hobos on the other side just as much as there are in this life. By nature and by instinct, they remain the same, and they have to be gradually educated and trained in order to outgrow their natural instincts. And just as these tramps and hobos would be insulting and often disgusting in this life, and would swear, curse, and do other things unsuitable for the family circle, were they introduced into it, just so they do the same things when they communicate and get once more into the earth atmosphere. These are the characters who also harm mediums unconsciously by rough handling, so to speak, and by damaging the delicate nervous organism upon which they operate when sending messages. The best and safest way to guard against personalities of this character, we are told, is to call to your aid spirit controls, guides, or advisors, who can assist you from the other side by arguing with such personalities and by removing them from your aura more or less forcibly should the occasion demand it. There are many cases on record in which more gentle measures did not bring about the required result 
and according to accounts received, very forcible methods had to be resorted to in order to eject these strangers before peace and harmony were finally restored. High Spirits and Their Helpful Messages When spirits of a higher order come, all this is reversed. You then come into contact with spiritual natures, and help, comfort, sympathy, and sound advice are given. When once you are assured of the assistance and cooperation of one or more individuals of this character, your time of tribulation as a medium is more or less over, and thenceforward you may depend upon steady and harmonious progression and advancement in your mediumship. You must be careful, however, as to how you receive messages claiming to come from exalted personages, as great names will often be given when the individuals in question are not there at all. This may be due at times to accident and misunderstanding, but there is also evidence, unfortunately, that lying spirits will resort to this stratagem to gain your confidence. You should, in this case, rely on your own common sense and judgment and insist upon proof of identity and direct evidence before you believe that the individual in question is really there. Guardian Spirits There is one sect or division of spirits whose office and general work and interest is particularly helpful to mortals, and that is the so-called guardian angels, or guides, who help govern and advise friends of theirs still in the body. The sympathy and counsel offered by these guardian spirits is at times very great. These spirits are said sometimes to prevent accident, suicide, and even murder by their kindly help and assistance. It is one of the most beautiful and inspiring thoughts in the spiritualistic philosophy to believe that those we love are constantly about, helping and cheering us along our hard and narrow way, and that they see our trials and tribulations and share them with us just as they did on earth. We must feel, too, that they are preparing a place for us and that when it comes time to solve the great mystery, we shall find helpful and loving assistance instead of a foreign land into which we shall then enter. Who make the best communicators? Those who possess a simple, open, candid, childlike nature are doubtless those who make the best communicators, other things being equal. It is because of this that Indians who lived close to nature so constantly communicate and act as guides, and doubtless for the same reason, Negroes are very psychic and receive many psychic phenomena. There is a great deal of evidence also, as we know, to show us that animals perceive spirits and psychic manifestations, and that they also sense phenomena more keenly than human beings. Between animals and ourselves, there is doubtless a link which unites us all into one conscious whole, this being the life of the universe which runs through every sentient thing. It is not uncommon for spirits to return at seances and seek the prayers or the help of the living. They express themselves as being in trouble and as requiring assistance before they can free themselves and proceed on their way. This is doubtless an important mission to fulfill, and when any wandering and distressed spirit makes itself manifest in this way, it should certainly be assisted in every way possible in the fulfillment of its desire and the discharge of its burden. Many cases of so-called haunted houses doubtless exist because of the persistent inability of the returning spirit to make anyone present see its wants and attend to them. 
were a good psychic or medium introduced into such a house, who could get into communication with the returning spirit, and when communication had been established, help it, there is no doubt that the haunting would cease, and the returning spirit would be greatly helped in its progress and advancement. Haunted Houses and Pacts All this is especially important in those cases of so-called pacts, where an agreement is made before death to appear afterwards, if that be possible. Many cases of this character are on record, and whenever such an agreement is made, it is most important that the living person on earth should fulfill his part towards the fulfillment of such a plan. By doing so, he may assist to an extent he perhaps does not realize in freeing the spirit's mind from earthly ties and conditions. Possibly unconscious messages. In considering this question of returning spirits, one final and important fact must not be lost sight of, and that is that messages may often be given through a medium or directly of which the spirit himself may be totally unconscious. He may think or dream or visualize a certain thought or message, and this may be reached or sensed by the medium and given forth as a conscious and intentional message. The reverse of this, however, is true. The mind of the discarnate spirit has been read by the medium in trance. His mental pocket has been picked, and he is given nothing voluntarily. Further, his thoughts may have been reflected upon a sort of psychic mirror or atmosphere, and they're seen and interpreted by the psychic. This, however, is a difficult question, which will be discussed in a later chapter. For the present, it should be borne in mind that all messages given by mediums need not necessarily be direct or intentional. They may merely have been obtained indirectly from the person in question, and would not be at all the message he would send were he aware of the fact that he was transmitting one. It is because of this fact that many of the messages appear to us so trivial and inconsequential. End of chapter 22. Recorded by Cynthia Sheeler. Website, CynthiaSheeler.ICanVoice.com Chapter 23 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Obsession and Insanity in this chapter I desire to place before the reader in a fair and clear manner facts which are too often neglected by spiritualists, but which those who develop or become mediums are apt to find out to their cost later in their development, unless they are aware of the facts at the beginning. Truth is always best, and it is accordingly best for the student to know the dangers and difficulties attendant upon spiritualism as well as the bright side. We do not wish to alarm or divert from interest any student by this in the following chapters. Precisely the reverse. But inasmuch as forewarned is forearmed, the student should be familiar with all the possible risks he is running, as there are such risks if he does not develop his mediumistic power systematically and along the right lines, as so often pointed out before in this book. THE REALITY OF SPIRIT OBSESSION as we saw in the last chapter, it is often easier for the low and less developed spirits to come in touch with us than those more highly developed, and this is especially the case where mediumistic development has not been such as to bring the student in touch with the higher forces and intelligences. Modern science does not accept the doctrine of spirit obsession as true, 
claiming that the cases of so-called spirit influence are really only cases of diseased mind and body requiring for their cure proper medical attention experienced spiritualists however know that while many cases of apparent obsession may be accounted for in this manner there are also cases of real influence coming from less developed disembodied spirits and as great a psychologist as professor william james said shortly before his death the refusal of modern enlightenment to treat possession as a hypothesis to be spoken of as even possible in spite of the mass of human tradition based on concrete experience in its favor has always seemed to me a curious example of the power of fashion in things scientific that the demon theory not necessarily a devil theory will have its innings again is to my mind absolutely certain one has to be scientific indeed to be blind and ignorant enough not to suspect any such possibility dr l nevias after an exhaustive study of the cases of demon possession in china and after an examination of contrary theories stated his conclusion that genuine cases of obsession were to be found and that they could not be accounted for by any other theory satisfactorily examples of obsession take again the case recorded by dr j godfrey Roper in his dangers of spiritualism he gives the case of a friend of his m who after attempting automatic writing and obtaining it successfully was unable to leave off the practice when he desired to even at night when retiring to rest m had habitually placed paper and pencil by his bedside in order to be able to write at once when summoned to do so and he had frequently been awakened from his sleep for this purpose much to the detriment of course of his mental and physical health after this there had come a still further development of the mystical power of writing the pencil too had been discarded and m had begun to trace the writing with his finger in the air he could thus it appears write out a message at some length and was fully able to read it afterwards just as though there was a piece of paper suspended in the air things had thus gone on for many months when m at last awakened to the fact that a great transformation was passing over his moral and intellectual nature and that some other mind had permeated his entire being and he was now conscious that he was ceasing to think his own thoughts in short there could not be any doubt that fetters were being woven around him which he was growing daily more incapable of breaking the condition of servility and submission which the control at first affected was now thrown off and the latter showed signs of absolute power no treatment either hypnotic or medical had the slightest influence upon the strange phenomenon and m had now given up all hope from this quarter some of the authorities whom he had consulted did not believe in obsession or possession others ascribed it to hysteria and fixed ideas help there was none dr roper goes on its dangers i tried to argue with the personality and prove to him that he was merely a subconscious product on the part of m when i persisted in denying the presence of a personality other than and different from that of m a very frenzy seemed to shake the frame of m and words of the most abusive kind were leveled at me what fools you are it exclaimed to tamper with things you do not understand to facilitate the invasion of spirits and then to deny that they exist to play with hell-fire and then be surprised that it hurts and burns i challenge you to propose any kind of experiment to test my utter and entire independence of the person of this idiot with whom i can do absolutely as i please see how i can handle him and ill-treat him i am now beating and hurting him and he can do nothing to defend himself with this there appeared red spots in different parts of m s face and he groaned as if in physical pain upon this i replied that i should accept the notion of an independent intelligence if it could be shown to be a fact and could be clearly demonstrated this he promised to do many similar cases can be found in this author's works 
particularly modern spiritualism and the supreme problem and though they are doubtless colored to some extent by the author's religious prejudices they are nevertheless valuable as records or human documents and should be studied as much there are other spiritualists who have written much on this subject of spirit obsession as for instance dr j m peebles whose work the demonism of the ages or spirit obsessions should be read by all interested in spiritualism many cases are given in this work how obsessing spirits gain control madame anita silvani who is an experienced and cautious medium makes the following wise statements concerning the possibilities of obsession in those roughly or over hastily developed as to the evils experienced by some persons who have sat in circles for development or for the manifestation of psychic power i would say that the whole theory of magnetic control rests upon a condition of mutual receptivity being established between the members of a circle but few reflect that the blending of magnetisms with those who form the spirit side of that circle is no less a part of the process and that without the aid of the magnetism of the sitters present nothing belonging to the spirit side of life would be obtained now in forming a circle how are you to ensure absolute freedom from the influence of the low or evil earth-bound spirits who crowd the streets of a large city the magnetic aura created by the circle hangs in a cloud around it and draws spirits toward it even as a magnet draws iron and steel and everything bright and rusty useful tools and dangerous weapons will be attracted by the powerful magnet poisoned magnetism if you once admit that the aura of a pure and good person can under certain conditions be poisoned by absorbing the tainted mixture from a mixed circle of all sorts of mortals and spirits you also admit that the good persons can carry home with them a sufficient portion of that poisoned magnetism to form the nucleus of a magnetic state congenial to the low and depraved spirits and into which any of them can enter a second time without the aid of the circle for this reason we are opposed to mixed or miscellaneous circles especially when sitters are not sincere and known to one another we believe that possession is not always evil and indeed it is often necessary but it is the continued control of a highly sensitive medium which does the harm by absorbing his finer life essence an earthbound spirit is like one who belongs to neither earth nor heaven nor gehenna he has lost his hold on the earth life and has not yet attained to the spirit world he lives in his astral body and having nothing of his own must borrow from those both above and below him on the ladder of development obsession versus mediumship mediumship is necessary without it there would be no means of knowledge no instruments through which to study the psychic plane but mediumship in exact proportion to the magnetic powers it confers becomes a greater and ever greater source of danger the further its development is carried unless the control of those powers can be handled with a firm hand and understood in all its aspects knowledge is the best safeguard and knowledge will be best obtained by those who can study all the conditions of psychic development it is said that there are two forms of magnetism the astral and the physical the fundamental difference between them is due to the different conditions under which the astral plane and the physical plane function how spirits influence us it must not be thought however that all i have said on obsession relates entirely to spiritualism or to development in circles or in private we live all the time in a spiritual world as well as in a material one and hence are open to the possibilities of obsession or influence both good or bad and many show in daily life the fact that this influence is strong for or against invisible intelligences are said to be with us much of the time some urging us on to false and wrong deeds others helping and encouraging us in actions of kindness sympathy and benevolence it is our duty to get in touch with the latter as much as possible and then we shall receive inspiration and enlightenment from higher sources than any at present about us 
the difficulty is to know how to do this without risk for as st paul said we must try the spirits and endeavor to prove to our own satisfaction whether they are good or bad there are various types of obsession but for our present purposes we shall omit many of the odd and exceptional phases such as vampires which will be discussed later on in this book and shall speak only of the ordinary type of spiritistic obsession the magnetic link the body and mind are doubtless connected by a sort of magnetic link the mind and the physical body are connected by means of a fluidic or etheric body in shape the double of the physical body it is owing to the fact that this body becomes detached from the physical frame at times that many of the phenomena of obsession and insanity occur the lines of force are broken and the etheric body becomes first of all loosened inside the physical body and then separated more or less altogether from it without the wish of the subject who may even be altogether unconscious of the process and not know what is going on within him he only experiences the resultant phenomena and it is for this reason that he does not know what method or course of treatment to pursue in order to get better or become cured all ordinary treatment is for this reason useless medical and physiological treatment for the reason that it acts only on the physical body not on the mind and hypnotic or other psychological treatment is almost equally useless for the reason that it acts on the mind without reaching the physical body any form of treatment which really cures must aim to act upon the etheric link or connection between mind and body and to act upon it in such a way that it will become readjusted both to the mind and body and this once accomplished the mind will be restored to its condition of health and sanity one of the chief things to do therefore is to act upon this magnetic link and draw back the etheric body into the physical we know that anesthetics of all kinds tend to drive out or disconnect the etheric from the physical body and it is possible that some day in the future science may discover a drug which will have the reverse effect of driving or drawing back the etheric into the physical body when this has been discovered it will doubtless be the means of curing many cases of insanity at present held incurable for the present inasmuch as this drug has never been discovered we must resort to magnetic and mesmeric treatment and other methods of cure to be enumerated more fully later on in this chapter early symptoms of obsession first of all let us consider some of the typical symptoms of obsession when they occur one of the primary things which will be noticed probably will be that the patient will be unable to sleep properly he suffers from insomnia coupled with restlessness and irritability soon after this he begins to experience a dull ache or pain at the base of the brain sometimes at the base of the spine also these spots will be tender to the touch a general debilitated or run-down nervous condition will be present perhaps unnoticed until attention be drawn to the fact if the subject has been practicing automatic writing let us say he will begin to have a more or less persistent desire to write this will keep pressing him forward and urging him to try what he can get with pencil or planchette thoughts seem put into his head ideas impressions and impulses which urge him to perform certain actions or do certain things these will increase in intensity and frequency. danger signals from this point onward great caution should be used as the danger point or dividing of the ways has now been reached a careful student of the occult might point out that the symptoms mentioned above and in the first chapter are alarmingly similar to those in the early stages of some types of insanity this is true i described them earlier in this book be it understood not as desirable symptoms but as those which are likely to appear and for which the student should be on the lookout the facts should be placed before him and when he is in possession of the knowledge concerning them he will know how best to meet them if he observes such symptoms 
we see therefore the importance of careful and systematic development in the cultivation of mediumship as i have so often pointed out before in this book after the above stage has been reached it is probable that the student who is on the wrong road will hear words as though inside his head or externally in space or possibly in his solar plexus though this is more rare or the phenomena may take the visual turn in which case the patient will see things mostly of an unpleasant nature such as snakes devils or monstrous or grotesque living objects thenceforward unfavorable symptoms will probably develop rapidly until a patient is completely obsessed and under control the line to be pursued in cases of this character is twofold first prevention second cure prevention of obsession prevention sound physical health is essential for all wholesome spiritual and mediumistic advancement and if the patient is sick or ill and especially if run down or depleted nervously he should stop all mediumistic practices until he is again restored to health plenty of outdoor exercise of as rugged a nature as possible would do wonders in cases of this character fresh air both day and night is essential tea coffee and alcohol should be avoided plenty of milk should be drunk by the patient as this both restores and builds up the nervous system in a way that nothing else can above all plenty of sleep must be obtained and no matter whether the patient desires ten hours or more at night this should be allowed and plenty of rest at all other times this is very essential at this stage of the proceedings the mental and spiritual health must be maintained equally with the physical your critical judgment and common sense must be exercised now as always both in judging the messages received and in the general conduct of life do not believe everything which is told you as there are many lying and deceiving intelligences as well as useful and good ones above all do not act upon or obey messages which do not strongly appeal to your own good sense and worldly judgment if you keep up your mediumistic practices sit only a short time each day not more than fifteen or twenty minutes at the longest and if possible at the same time each day these two rules as before pointed out are very important never allow yourself to continue beyond the time limit you have set yourself no matter how interesting the communications may be but say in a firm loud voice we must stop now or i will sit again at the same time tomorrow for the continuation of the message you should then discontinue the writing important warnings and precautions never go inside your own head and examine its processes or introspect for too long a time the wonders of brain and thought may appeal to your imagination but never let them influence you or cause you to turn your thoughts inward in the attempt to solve them if you do it is sure to end disastrously and there is no more reason why you should be conscious of your thinking apparatus than of your digestive or circulatory apparatus which is equally mysterious and wonderful let them go on by themselves without thinking anything about them but using them rather as instruments for your life purposes always keep an interest in external things and live as it were outside your head in the outer world all the time become interested in matter-of-fact and worldly objects and interests as this will tend to distract your mind from yourself and restore you to a condition of normal healthy-mindedness cultivate a sense of humor and never take yourself or your mediumship so seriously that you cannot see the humorous side of a situation when it may arise endeavor to harden the inner self so to say and focus and concentrate it at a given point which is under your conscious volition and control keep the center of consciousness always intact and be sure that the center is yourself do not focus either the sight or the interest on external images or impressions when these become persistent when this is the case force yourself to banish them by an effort of will and by deliberately turning the attention into other more practical directions 
further advice when dropping to sleep always keep your mind centered on yourself and never allow yourself any flights of imagination and never wonder what is going on or endeavor to catch yourself falling asleep as you might with safety do at other times value sleep and look upon it as a kindly friend even those who are seriously obsessed are safe when they are asleep and no matter how terrifying their daily experiences voices or visions may be they very rarely have unpleasant or terrifying dreams sleep is the resting time of the soul and if the spirit is en rapport with itself as it should be it will be protected from all external influences during the hours of sleep cultivate your own force of will and self-possession if the emotional nature is too intense this should by all means be calmed down especially before going to sleep a prolonged warm bath will have a very good effect in such cases one other preventative practice will be found very useful it is this seated in a dark room concentrate your will upon the outer limits of your aura that is the auric egg which was described in the chapter on the aura by proper concentration and practice you will be enabled to harden or toughen the outer shell as it were of this auric egg rendering it impervious to extraneous psychic or spiritual influences this you should always practice before dropping off to sleep those who have developed this power in a proper and adequate manner are absolutely impervious to any evil or malign influences from without the cure of obsession cure supposing now that you have not taken these precautions in time and that you have become actually obsessed for the time being or that you meet one who is unfortunate enough to be in that condition what is to be done the advice which was given under the last heading should be followed here to some extent the physical health should be built up by all means in your power sleep is absolutely essential and as much of it must be secured as possible it may be necessary even to resort to sleeping draughts or powders in order to secure the necessary sleep these should be prescribed by your regular physician however while drugs are doubtless harmful bromide and similar medicines can be taken with benefit at such a time since the evil effects of the drug are more than counterbalanced by the benefits derived by mind and spirit alcohol must be discontinued at once and a milk diet substituted you must impress upon the patient for such he is now that no one can help him beyond a certain limited point he must help himself the cure must come from within rather than from without how to use the mind distract his mind by all possible methods so as to make it objective instead of introspective do not let him go inside his head for a moment to listen to the voices or to see the visions which float before him but immediately anything of the kind occurs distract his attention and interest him in something which is going on about him and of as dramatic a nature as possible so as to ensure attention do not let him go inside his head for the more he lives within himself the more difficult will he be to cure you must teach him to disregard or to deny the voices or impressions which insistently come to him if they flatter him and tell him to do certain things teach him that these voices are evil and lying and are not to be trusted for if they were otherwise he would not be in his present condition never imagine for a moment that an obsessed person is illogical or is not open to reason his reasoning faculties are often keenly alert and have often to be appealed to to effect a cure these mental devices are very important though they do not as before said go to the root of the matter diagnosis and treatment clairvoyant diagnosis is very valuable and a trained clairvoyant can sometimes see the obsessing spirits and describe them when this is the case the problem of cure becomes more real and more apparent if the patient believes in the efficacy of prayer this is doubtless a potent method of cure the religious nature is one of the most fundamental sides of our character 
and is a factor which is capable of exerting an immense pressure when properly brought to bear encourage the patient therefore to pray if he is at all of a religious turn of mind magnetic treatment such as passes etc is often very valuable and will assist in restoring the patient to health by acting upon the etheric body direct as before explained combined with suggestion this is one of the most potent weapons that can be used in our present state of knowledge by these methods also we can in some cases toughen the outer protective auric shell if the patient is unable to direct his mind sufficiently to do this himself by proper striving however he will soon place himself in the direction of the great healing cosmic currents and when once he has done so will begin to improve immediately and make rapid progress spiritual treatment the most important remedial measure must now be described inasmuch as the obsessing intelligences are spirits usually of an evil or lying nature though they may be only ignorant or bungling who have wrecked the medium's nervous mechanism through their ignorance of how to operate it they are capable of being reached and removed by other spirits that is we should approach them not from the physical or even the mental plane but from the spirit side of life one of the best ways to do this is to secure the services of a reliable trance or clairvoyant medium who in the mediumistic condition is capable of discerning the spirits and influencing the patient an experienced medium of this character has with him certain guides or controls who are helpful and friendly these guides if called upon will assist by arguing with or if necessary forcefully removing the obsessing intelligences who are influencing the psychic the case should be explained to the medium's guides when the latter is in trance and their assistance asked they will then undertake to remove the obsessing spirits and will often succeed in doing so after a few trials though in some instances they are unable to persuade or induce the obsessing spirits to leave and are not powerful enough to enforce their removal this however is the most potent and effectual method which we know at present and should be employed whenever possible if a medium of this character is unavailable then a second person should speak to the obsessing intelligences direct and reason with them as he would with a human being pointing out to them the uselessness of the proceeding the injury they are doing the medium the harm to themselves etc it is rare indeed that such measures properly applied and coupled with the mental and physical treatment described above will fail to remove the influences which are at work the brighter side of the subject i have described fully and freely the seamy side of spiritualism and its possible dangers the student must not be discouraged however from this black outlook the dangers exist truly but they also exist in other lines of experimental research and many lives have been lost in attempts to perfect some system of medicine or some antidote for poison which today we use with safety it is the same here properly carefully and systematically developed mediumship should present none of these dangers or difficulties but should on the contrary bring the student into touch with higher planes of thought and activity and enable him to approach the more angelic sphere of being as by careless or wrong development he will as surely come in contact with spirits of the opposite nature for this reason i again urge the student to study and practice carefully and cautiously as he proceeds so that none of these unpleasant or terrifying experiences may at any time come to him End of chapter 23 Obsession and Insanity Recording by Pamela Krantz Chapter 24 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org your psychic powers and how to develop them by harroward carrington chapter twenty four prayer concentration and silence the subjects treated in this chapter will probably be of special value to the student after that immediately preceding it 
We have already spoken of the value of prayer in certain cases, and it may be said that both silence and concentration, under certain conditions, will always prove of great value, not only in the cure of obsession, but at all other times when dark clouds loom up on the horizon. In order to secure the best results from these psychological processes, however, they should be practiced according to certain laws, and the reason for their operation should be thoroughly understood by the student. WHAT THE SILENCE REALLY SIGNIFIES What is called the silence in general New Thought philosophy is a peculiar psychic state into which the student enters in order to secure certain results. As the term implies, quiet or silence are necessary factors, but they are mere means to an end. Silence in itself would achieve nothing. It means that in this condition, thereby induced, certain practices may be followed which produce the desired results. Concentration is the focusing of the entire being at any given moment upon a central point of interest, either inward or outward, as the case may be. It may be upon some object, or some inner thought or psychic condition. Concentration upon objects is usually employed as a mere outward exercise, to train the mind to act according to instructions, so to speak, so that when the time comes, it may be employed in useful and helpful psychic activity. The Value of Concentration Concentration means power. The more we concentrate on anything, the more certain it is to be accomplished, and the better will the results be. Just as a number of streams meeting at a certain point will create a rushing, mighty current, so in the same manner will scattered psychic activity and forces, if brought to a common point, produce certain powerful results, which may be centered, or turned into one direction or into another. One of the chief practical uses of concentration is the use it may be put to, to hold or bind the self together. We should never let it be scattered in a variety of separate channels of expression, but rather concentrated into one single powerful unit. Just as the strands of a rope may become separated, so the mind may become disintegrated and lose its initial power. In this weakened condition, it can be acted upon by other minds and forces, just as the single strands of rope can be broken, but the whole rope would resist any strain put upon it. The mind, when concentrated and acting under proper direction and control, is similarly impervious to all outside influences which may not be desired, and at the same time is itself a powerful factor either for good or evil. Concentration Exercises A few simple exercises in concentration may here be given, which will be found useful not only in psychic development, but in every phase of life. 1. Read a page of some heavy technical book, the meaning of which is not at all clear to you. Reread the page with the determination to understand what it means. Read this over a number of times if necessary, never letting your will relax for a moment, but determined to understand the thought of the author. If you do this, you will, after a few readings, the number varying, be enabled to grasp fully what is meant. 2. Place a watch in front of you, and look at the second hand, until it has completed the circle marking the minute. During this process, never let your thoughts wander from the second hand for a moment. Concentrate upon it fully. You will probably find that your thoughts are wandering, and that you cannot even for the space of a minute fix them absolutely under your control. Practice this until you have succeeded in accomplishing it. 3. Call up before your mind's eye a picture of a certain living friend. Hold this image in front of you as long as possible, making the details in every way as clear as you can by endeavoring to fill out mentally the color of the hair, of the eyes, the complexion, and any peculiar markings that you can remember. Now, when the face is vivid before your mind's eye, see whether you can discover any peculiarities in the face hitherto unknown to you. If you note anything of the kind, ascertain the next time you see this friend whether or not these impressions are correct. 4. Call up before your mental vision the face of some dead relative or friend. Concentrate upon it, holding it firmly before you in space. Study it closely, filling in all details as before. Finally, when you have held this vividly for a minute or so, without wavering in your attention, open your psychic or mental ears, so to speak, and see if you can receive any message from the person whose face is before you. 
This will be found a very useful practice, on occasion, at the beginning of your mediumship, and will enable you possibly to receive direct communications when you have tried in every other way and failed. You will not be able to do so, however, until you have mastered fully this faculty of concentration. THE DYNAMIC POWER OF THE MIND Having progressed so far, you may now concentrate upon certain mental or psychic processes, while willing or demanding that some return be made as a result of your volitional activity. Remember that every thought you send out into the universe attracts to itself others of a like nature, and ultimately returns to the sender with added power, just as a boomerang returns to the thrower. Altruistic thoughts, such as love, justice, forgiveness, etc., will therefore return to the owner and make him happier for having thought them. Evil and malevolent thoughts will, on the contrary, return and make the sender more unhappy and more innately evil in consequence. The path we travel, whether it be upward or downward, always gets easier as we proceed. We are helped along not only by the powers of good or darkness, but by our own thoughts and their results. Thoughts are things. No thought is ever annihilated, and there is evidence to show that thought can take material form on occasion, and influence, either for good or evil, those at a distance. This will be more fully explained, however, in subsequent chapters. THE VALUE OF PRAYER We must now say a few words on prayer, and its great value to one who sends out the prayer thought. There are many who believe that prayer is superstition, since they do not believe in a personal God who grants or answers prayers, but rather in an impersonal creative power which orders all things according to unvarying laws. Even on this theory, however, prayer, under certain conditions, is fully justified, for in the first place, as we have just seen, helpful and wholesome thoughts tend to bring their own reward. In the next place, prayer is an auto-suggestion of great value, and its influence upon the mental and physical life is frequently very great. In the third place, prayer will help and buoy you up by giving you added confidence and belief in your powers. In the fourth place, inasmuch as telepathy is a fact in nature, you may, while in that condition, reach the minds of other human beings who can help you and will actually do so without knowing why. The many interesting cases which may be found of answers to prayers, bringing a material return, fully justify its use from that point of view. Fifth, you can doubtless reach by telepathy friends in the spirit life who may be brought into more or less direct touch with you during the prayerful condition of mind which is certainly closely akin to certain phases of subjective mediumship. They may, in this manner, be made aware of your condition for the first time, and will then endeavor to help you. Sixth, by prayer you may bring yourself into harmony with the great cosmic currents of good, which, as before explained, are playing hither and thither upon our universe in much the same way as light, heat, gravitation, electricity, and other material forces play or act upon it and us. All these material factors must be taken into account apart from the possibility that there is a receptive, loving, and protecting power in the world which is capable of helping us in time of need. Prayer in Obsession In obsession cases particularly, prayer is of value because of the relief from tension and the wholesome mental attitude induced. Just as a drowning man will clutch at a straw so those who are in terrible distress will frequently resort to this practice, when they would not think of doing so at any other time, and in a sense they are justified in so doing. There is an old saying that man's extremity is God's opportunity. It may be that prayer, in the ordinary sense of the word, is not needed during an ordinary healthy life, provided that it is lived in accordance with the laws of nature and according to its own highest mental and spiritual insight. At the same time, there may be occasions when it is justified and helpful, and certainly it is proved so in certain cases of difficulty and obsession. HOW PRAYER CURES The beneficial effects of prayer may be explained in many cases quite simply. As explained in the chapter devoted to the subconscious mind, certain groups of thoughts tend to become bound together, forming what is known as a complex. If this activity be wholesome, the result is beneficial and, in fact, all our educational processes depend upon this complex formation. On the other hand, these groups of thoughts may be harmful, 
in which case they tend to press upon the mind from beneath in much the same way that physical tumors might press upon some healthy structure in the body and impede its functional activity the mind therefore becomes diseased by reason of this pressure and will only resume its wholesome attitude when this pressure is removed by means of hypnotic suggestion and spiritual treatment the mind may be opened up and explored and this complex found and removed this once done the mind is restored to its wholesome activity and the cure is complete this is known in technical language as the purging treatment as soon as the unwholesome load is removed the mind is cured now in prayer when a full and free confession is made this same purging process occurs the mind is freed from its burden and is consequently restored to health by its own inner nature this being so it may be seen that prayer as such is a real curative process and in many types of obsession and similar cases it may be employed effectually as before said as a therapeutic measure of great value in curing the sick mind end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by libby gone your psychic powers and how to develop them by Harroward carrington chapter twenty five the human fluid the human body is charged with a certain magnetism which differs from all other forms of magnetism and electricity in the world all other forces of which we have knowledge are non-intelligent and have to be guided and directed by mind or by some law in order to bring about any definite or desired result it is therefore meaningless to explain the continued and consecutive movements of the planchette board or any similar instrument by saying it is due to magnetism or to electricity or to any similar power these are all blind forces and must be directed in order that any intelligent result may be obtained the vital magnetism which is present in the body is also a blind force but it is under the control of the subconscious mind and under certain conditions to be spoken of later may be played upon or manipulated by external intelligences in this way the various results are obtained nature and properties of the fluid this vital magnetism appears to be fluidic or semi-fluidic in form and capable of flowing from one organism into another it is upon this principle that various magnetic cures are based the fluid running from the operator's fingers into the body of the patient treated that this fluidic energy is present in any human body may be proven in a number of ways in the first place the human aura which i described in an earlier chapter is partly a manifestation of this vital activity the colors being the varying vibratory counterparts of the energy radiated in psychometry again it is this vital energy which passes into objects impregnating them with its fluidic properties each individual has his own peculiarly constituted and personal vital magnetism and this differs from all others in quality and properties a fully developed psychic is enabled to distinguish these one from another and a medium in a trance may be enabled to get into communication with a deceased person through or by means of this fluidic impression left upon it as explained in the chapter devoted to trance one or two practical examples or exercises may serve to show the student the reality of this fluidic emanation and how he may employ these to convince his skeptical friends also of its reality experiment to prove the existence of the fluid one a very simple test is the following hang a dead black cloth over the back of a chair and see that no light falls directly on the cloth the light in the room should be somewhat subdued and you should stand between it and the cloth so as to throw your hands held against the latter into shadow now approach your two hands one to the other and touch the fingertips together the hands being otherwise opened wide palms turned toward yourself and thumbs pointing toward the ceiling in this condition you will probably find that as the first and fourth fingertips touch the second and third have to be bent considerably to touch one another the hand should be at a distance of about three inches from the black cloth and about fifteen inches from your face hold the fingertips together for about thirty seconds then very gradually pull them apart and you will see coming from and joining your fingers streams of whitish misty vapor 
which is the fluid connection between the hands, which you have established by the previous contact. If you move the fingers slightly up and down after they have been separated an inch or so, you will find that the stream or bands of light follow the fingers, still connecting them, which will prove that this is not due to a hallucination or to what is called persistence of vision. How to magnetize water. 2. Place two glasses of water side by side on the table. Over one of these, place the tips of your fingers, held together so as to form a point as much as possible. Hold these over the water in one glass for four or five minutes, willing that your vital magnetism should pass into the water and affect it. If now you ask a sensitive person who has not seen you perform the experiment to pick out the glass of water which has been treated magnetically, he will be able to do so almost invariably, and will tell you that the water sparkles as though charged with some effervescent gas. Life Preserved by the Human Fluid Some recent experiments conducted by a group of scientific men in Bordeaux, France, have proved conclusively that the human body radiates a form of vital energy which may be extremely powerful in its results. A lady possessing the power of projection or externalizing this vital energy in a remarkable degree discovered that by placing her hands for 15 or 20 minutes daily for a period of two or three weeks over certain dead objects such as oysters, canary birds, fishes, and even larger animals such as guinea pigs and rabbits, she was enabled to preserve them indefinitely, that is, instead of decomposing as they ordinarily would have done, they dried up or mummified and were preserved for months with no changes whatever taking place in their substance. They never decomposed. Proofs of the Human Fluid this fact was fully endorsed by several chemists and physicians who studied her case, and they stated that this was due to the fact that the vital emanation coming from her body killed or destroyed the bacteria usually present in all these bodies after death. This could be traced with the microscope. For example, six oysters were allowed to decompose partially, while six were treated by her. The six that were treated never decomposed at all, but dried up or desiccated without any putrefaction. Now. When the other half-dozen oysters had partially decomposed and bacteria could be seen under the microscope, Madame X was requested to place her hands over the oysters and treat them. After fifteen minutes' treatment, they were again examined and found that thousands of bacteria had been killed. At the end of a few days, they had all disappeared, and the oysters dried up, and thenceforward no decomposition whatever was noted. This is a very striking proof of the reality of the human fluid and its peculiar action in certain cases. There is evidence to show, however, that in other instances its action is different from this, and that it imparts life and energy rather than proves destructive, as in the above unique case. Many persons have the power of preserving the life of flowers by treating them with their hands in a similar manner every day, and the student might well try this experiment and to see what extent he can preserve the life of certain flowers. Others of a like nature being preserved at the same time by another person and under similar conditions to note the difference, if any, between the two sets. It is this vital magnetism which, projected beyond the bodily limits under the action of the will, is responsible for many physical phenomena, as we shall see in chapter 38. How material objects become charged by the fluid. Material objects, particularly of a sponge-like nature, such as wood, are capable of being charged up very highly by this vital magnetism, and when this is the case they become en rapport, with the medium, who is enabled to move or manipulate them from a distance by his power of will, because of this vital fluidic connection. We shall speak more fully of this, however, in the chapter devoted to physical phenomena. It may be proved experimentally also that this fluidic magnetism is either capable of sensing pain or is the means whereby pain is carried from the nerve centers to the consciousness. Exteriorization of Sensibility under certain conditions, the fluidic body, which is the inner part of the physical body and acts as its double, may be hypnotic, and magnetic processes can be removed entirely from the physical body, in which case it may be set upon by the suggestion from others present at the time. For example, Colonel Albert de Rochas of Paris succeeded in entirely disengaging or separating the fluidic body of his subject from the physical body and gradually removed it to greater and greater distances until it stood several feet from the entranced subject's physical organism. He then pricked the surface of the fluidic body with needles, 
and the sleeping subject experienced these sensations of pain in her own physical body at the spot or point exactly corresponding to the point picked on the etheric body repercussion this seems to show that there is a direct vital or magnetic link between the etheric and the physical organisms and that injury done to the one reacts upon the other by means of what is known as repercussion this is a very significant fact when we remember that in materializing seances it sometimes happened that the figure is seized or in some way injured by the sitter and that the entranced medium is injured in exactly the same way that the materialized figure is injured this fact has long been known to experienced spiritualists this curious fact also has great significance and throws an interesting sidelight on many of the phenomena of so-called witchcraft we know that many of these stories relate that the witch assuming another form visited other scenes or localities and if cut shot or injured there she herself was found the next day to have these exact injuries though lying in her bed at some distance from the scene of the event in question such stories certainly appear more credible when we take into consideration the above facts for both sets of phenomena seem to depend upon repercussion how the human fluid may impress photographic plates the human fluid may also be proved to exist by means of photography if a sensitive plate be wrapped in black paper and the hand of the psychic or medium of suitable temperament be placed upon it the fluidic radiation coming from the hands and fingers will influence the plate through the enveloping black paper and the impress of the hands will be found upon the plate this can only be accounted for by supposing that the fingers became in some way radioactive during the experiment many psychics can go further than this and can impress upon the plate an image or figure of their thought at the time Thus, when holding the plate between their palms, or on their forehead, or against the solar plexus, and thinking of a sheep, a cat, a chair, etc., the image of a sheep, cat, or chair is impressed upon the plate. Experiments such as these may be tried by any student, and are of extreme interest and also of value scientifically when they are successful. It is to be hoped that many readers of this book will try experiments of this character and report any results they may obtain. End of chapter 25。Chapter 26 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hia Oyd Carrington. Chapter 26 Self-Projection By self-projection is meant the faculty or ability to send out or cause to travel to a distance the etheric self or double by an effort of will. This seems to be, to some extent, inherent in some individuals and occurs with them spontaneously and almost against their will. They go into trance and, at the end of a certain time, find that they have left their bodies and travel to some distant scene this however is rare in the majority of the cases the power has to be developed by long and assiduous cultivation of what the thought body is composed before i come to speak of this projection of the self a few words are necessary as to the nature and composition of this etheric body or double which is thus projected the physical body is composed of millions of tiny cells, and in each cell there is a center or nucleus of energy. This center is so infinitely small that it cannot be detected even by the highest powered microscope. All that we know is that physical matter in the cell is in some way vitalized or rendered living when it comes in contact with this vital center. The source of the energy is invisible and cannot be determined by us it seems to well up from nowhere now this center of energy constitutes a sort of psychic point or cell of its own and as there are millions of them in the body corresponding to the number of physical cells it is obvious that there are millions of vital cells which conform exactly to the shape of the body since they correspond to its physical cells in life these psychic centers have been called psychomeres, and their bulk is estimated at about one millionth that of the physical body. 
The density of etheric double therefore would be about one millionth as dense as the physical body. The combined weight of these psychomeres has been variously estimated, but probably varies between that of the ten posted stamps and one ounce and a half. This would represent the weight of the astral or etheric body, and is such that it would float slowly upward through the physical atmosphere as would a balloon. This fact coincides with what we know of the gradual floating upward of the spiritual body after death. Inner Finer Bodies It is this body which we inhabit after we discard the denser physical frame. It is not necessary to suppose that our consciousness is scattered throughout the whole of this body any more than it is at present. The center of spiritual activity and the power of the will and mind may be a point of force, so to speak, within this etheric double, and we may utilize and animate it just as we utilize and animate the physical body in this life. After a time, it is probable that we discard this etheric body to assume one of even lesser density, and that this process continues a number of times until the spirit ultimately inhabits one of such infinitely fine matter, if such it can be called that it is practically a mental or spiritual body. This is what we learn from many spirits who have communicated such facts to us. It is this body, therefore, which becomes disengaged from the physical body during life and goes on trips or excursions, carrying with it the consciousness of the individual and returns to animate the physical body at the end of a certain period of time possible dangers and how they are overcome when this disunion or severance takes place there is always a connecting link a magnetic cord which unites the physical and the etheric bodies if this cord were to get broken for any reason reanimation would be impossible and the death of the body would take place this is the great danger attendant upon experiments of this character, but such a phenomena is only possible in cases of very deep trance, where the separation is almost complete, and very little serves to disconnect it entirely. It is highly pr improbable that any but the most advanced student could reach this stage and when he has reached it, certain mystical inner practices may be resorted to which would offset this possible danger it is this body which is occasionally photographed and many so-called spirit photographs are in reality photographs not of discarnate but of incarnate spirits that is they are wandering doubles of spirits still in the flesh again many apparitions and figures seen in haunted house are of this nature they constitute the projections of living persons rather than those who have passed over, and it takes an experienced psychic student to distinguish between the two types of figures. They have been known to appear at sciences, also in the form of materializations. In addition to these etheric bodies or doubles, there may also be mental or thought bodies created entirely by the mind, and the will of the subject thus in a case known to us a clairvoyant was sent on a trip to the house of a friend and asked to describe the individual whom she found there she described a certain person in detail hair eyes features etc given at great length when the psychic had finished and recovered full consciousness she was told that her description was entirely wrong and that no such person existed in the house in question and her description was throughout erroneous in order to prove this a journey was made at once to the house of the subject in question when the facts were stated he replied that although he himself did not in any way resemble the clairvoyant description this corresponded exactly and in one minute detail to a character he was creating and writing about in his book. 
in other words his thoughts had created the figure so vividly that it actually lived for the time being as an objective entity and was seen as such by the entranced clairvoyant we can see from this then that thoughts are things they assume shape and in a certain sense live in the physical world all of our thoughts have a definite shape as well as a definite color and the more advanced students along the path of development can see and describe these thoughts we are told as clearly as we see objects how the selves may be projected if this may be true it has a very significant bearing upon cases which occur and have been reported in the past for example the reader will doubtless recall the case of dr jekyll and mr hyde by robert louis stevenson a most important case for all students to study here as we know the original individual finally became two dr jekyll developed another self calling himself mr hyde dr jekyll was kindly helpful and sympathetic hyde was evil malicious and wholly repulsive these two selves were developed in the original person and the split between them became greater and greater as the months went by finally mr hyde assumed complete supremacy and to jekyll vanished forever in this case it was not a mere change of personality which could be accounted for on any psychological grounds it was an actual physical transformation apparently there were two separate bodies which were transformed one into the other suppose now that the good self dr jekyll also the bad self mr hyde existing as separate mental beings each had the power of self projection they would each create by their own thoughts a separate body and this being would resemble in outward appearance the thoughts which created it cases of this character might therefore exist and might conceivably be explained on scientific principles we must be careful then of the character of the thought self which we build up for if these resembles outwardly its inner structure we may many of us come to resemble monstrosities rather than human beings at some stage of our development when the plane is reached where thoughts predominate and shape the expression of the self this idea has been graphically portrayed in john uri lloyd's book etudorfer this inner etheric body which is expelled to a distance by the power of will in cases of self-projection may be released and projected by the student after a certain amount of practice he should go about this cautiously feeling his way as if it were but proceeding more or less along the following lines place yourself in a perfectly composed attitude either on a couch or in a large chair close the eyes and breathe deeply for a few minutes all the time holding the mind on a central point of concentration travel over your body in thought and at each point or spot dwelt upon by you will that your etheric body becomes detached or loosened from its connection with the physical body as you begin to gain control of this process you may hear or rather sense a process of separation taking place resembling a click and inwardly feeling like the disconnection of an electric current when this has been completed at one point travel to another do not try too many on any one occasion and always 
be sure to restore by an effort of will the original connected condition before you terminate the experiment. Further directions and advice. After you have gone round your body in this way, and have succeeded in disconnecting it more or less completely, you should then call up before you, in space, a certain distant locality, such as the room of a friend, and throwing the whole force of your being into a single determined effort of will, force yourself mentally to leave your body and travel to the locality before you. If you feel that you are losing consciousness, or that everything is going black before you, discontinue the experiment at once and return to your physical body. If you can keep your self-consciousness active, you may safely travel to any distance, feeling assured that you will be able to return whenever you want to and reanimate your own physical frame. All this, of course, takes time and persistence of development and cannot be acquired in a few days. Moreover, I would advise the student not to attempt this process until he was progressed further in his studies and read the advice contained in the last chapter. Should he, however, make up his mind to do so, he should proceed along the above lines, advancing cautiously all the time and never allowing himself to lose consciousness at any stage of the proceedings. When he has acquired this power, he will have in his possession a wonderful knowledge and a means of acquiring information and spiritual insight which others who have not developed it are totally unable to comprehend. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nissa Schmidt your psychic powers and how to develop them by harroward carrington chapter twenty seven apparitions an apparition is a phantasmal being commonly called a ghost which is seen by sensitive individuals under certain conditions before we can speak more fully of apparitions we must answer the question which naturally occurs namely what is a ghost Modern theories and ideas on this question have changed greatly within the past quarter of a century. At that time, if an ordinary scientific man were questioned on this subject, he would probably reply that it was a hallucination, the result of a diseased mind, and had no existence in reality outside the imagination of the subject who perceived it. But in these days this idea has been greatly modified, and it must now be admitted that ghosts are very much more complicated than this. In the first place, when the Society for Psychical Research began its investigations in 1882, it was found that a large percentage of cases of apparitions occurred at or about the time of death. Some occurred before and some after, but most of them were approximately at that time. Further, the subjects who perceived or saw them were not diseased or imaginative persons, and probably never had another experience of this character, either before or afterwards. The questions naturally arose. Why this connection? What is the bond uniting the dying person with the apparition seen? Some scientific men, it is true, have come forward and stated that this connection is due to chance and that there was no real connection whatever. This is, however, disproved by the report of the Society, as the result of several years' work. They succeeded in obtaining answers from some 30,000 persons, and calculating the percentage of possible coincidences, they found the number of coincidences was hundreds of times more numerous than chance could account for. Professor Sidgwick's committee, who conducted the investigation, therefore signed the following statement. 
apparitions coinciding with death. Between deaths and apparitions of the dying person, a connection exists which is not due to chance alone. This we hold as a proved fact. There is, therefore, some definite connection between the two, and the task was to ascertain its nature and character. The theory was then advanced that, inasmuch as telepathy is a fact scientifically proved, and inasmuch as figures and images may be transferred from one mind to another by this means, the dying person might transfer a vision or image of himself to the mind of some friend or relative, so that this person would see not a real outstanding figure, but a mental picture or image of him, created by the thought of the dying person and conveyed telepathically to the mind of the living friend. These telepathic hallucinations, as they are called, doubtless account for many of the apparitions which are seen at or about the moment of death, also for many of those which occur before death and during the lifetime of the individual. But how about those which occur after death? Here we should have to assume that some other process was involved, or else extend our belief so as to cover and embrace the action of discarnate spirits. Phantasms of the Dead one theory of these apparitions, seen after the death of the person they represent, is that they embody the thought of the dead person. For example, an individual spirit may continue to think over its life and the scenes of its varied activities, and these recollections and thoughts influencing the minds of those still living by means of telepathy would cause them to see the phantasmal image of the person thinking the thoughts. This, however, is a question which we shall discuss more fully in the next chapter. For the present, it may be said that this is one theory advanced to explain so-called phantasms of the dead, or ghosts, as opposed to phantasms of the living and phantasms of the dying. Ghosts that touch. There are many cases of apparitions, however, which cannot be thus easily explained by assuming that they are the projection or telepathic influence of a living mind, or the mind of a discarnate spirit. In many cases, they seem to be real substantial beings, to occupy space and exist as real, semi-solid, or material phantoms. Those who have been convinced of the reality of an etheric or spiritual body need have no difficulty in assuming that it, it is this body which is seen at such times. And in many cases, we find strong evidence for supposing that a body of this character actually exists. For example, in one historic instance, a doctor and his wife both saw the figure of a woman standing at the foot of their bed and saw it cross the room and place its fingers over a small nightlight, which was burning on the mantelpiece. At the moment the phantom thus placed his hands over the light, it was extinguished, and the room was left in darkness. Here it is difficult to suppose that any thought creation, or telepathic hallucination, of any character existed, for the reason that a physical phenomenon was produced, and no hallucination could have done this. Materialized Phantoms Again, in many cases, the phantasmal form or apparition is seen to open doors, lift curtains, raise bedclothes, etc. And in such cases, again, we must assume that a real phantom exists. The problem is thus more complicated than at first appears, and as Mr. Andrew Lang remarked, Consequently, if these stories are true, some apparitions are ghosts, real objective entities filling space. Hallucinations cannot draw curtains, or open doors, or cause thumps. Not real thumps. Hallucinatory thumps are different. Dr. Burns tells of a gentleman who, in a dream, pushed against a door in a distant house, so that those in the room were scarcely able to resist the pressure. Now, if this rather staggering anecdote be true, the spirit of a living man being able to affect matter is also, so to speak, material and is an actual entity, an astral body. 
These arguments then make in favor of the old-fashioned theory of ghosts and wraiths, as things objectively existing, rather than the view that all these ghosts are necessarily subjective in origin. Phantasms created by thought. These phantasms are doubtless thought bodies, in many cases constructed by the operating intelligence itself. One interesting fact in this connection is this, that it is nearly always stated by those who have seen figures of this kind that the phantom is clear and plainly visible about the head and the upper part of the body, but that the apparition dwindles down to a vaporous film toward the feet. In other words, the upper part of the body is much clearer than the lower part. If the phantom were a definite thought creation, this is only what we should expect, for we think of the upper portion of our bodies much more than the lower portion. We are more conscious of our head and shoulders, and the upper portion of the trunk, and the hands and arms, and only vaguely conscious of the legs and lower portions of the body. This is exactly what we find in apparitions, and it would therefore seem that the figures are clear in outline just to the extent that the operating intelligence is intensely conscious of the appearance of the body he is creating or building up. Phantoms which impart information. There are also certain cases on record in which the phantom has given the recipient of the experience some important information which he did not know previously, where certain papers are hidden, etc. Such cases certainly prove that an independent intelligence is there, a spirit which is thus manifesting its presence. It must be admitted, however, that most apparitions are purposeless and meaningless, but this is easily accounted for by supposing that we see, at such times, not the spirit itself, but its mere projected thought a phantom created by the spirit, rather than the spirit itself. Most apparitions are, doubtless, of this nature. We have seen that there are apparitions of the living, of the dying, and of the dead, mostly attached to human beings. When they are attached to localities, they become local phantoms, or cases of haunting, of which we shall speak in the next chapter. Experimental Apparitions in addition to these, there are so-called cases of experimental apparitions, in which an individual succeeds in creating a phantasmal figure at a distance by an effort of will or thought. These closely resemble certain cases of self-projection on the one hand and cases of witchcraft on the other, and form an intermediary between them. Since on the one hand they are mere mental pictures, and on the other they are real physical entities. Experimental apparitions, then, seem to bridge the gulf between these two types of phenomena and form a connecting link. Apparitions may be induced experimentally by willing very strongly, just as you are falling asleep, that you will appear to a certain person at a certain time, and, if this is properly managed, it will be successful in a large number of cases. This may also be induced experimentally by means of hypnotic suggestion or magnetic or mesmeric processes, and when in the trance the spirit of the sleeper may be directed to a certain locality and there seen by those present. The natives of West Africa claim to be able to do this more or less at will. They can project the double or etheric body and, so to speak, materialize at the other end. How to Create Thought Forms The same laws which prevail in many of the previous exercises also rule here. The student should see to it that he retains a grasp of his own personality and does not lose control of his inner self at any stage of the proceedings. As he progresses in his development along these lines, he should endeavor to make the apparition which appears at the other end of the line, so to speak, more or less solid. After he has once succeeded in the process of projection, 
he should throw all his will into the effort to make the projected form more and more substantial and to will that his self-consciousness and activity be actually transferred to the distant scene in this way he is not only seen by others who may happen to be present but is also enabled to see for himself what is actually going on in that place and obtains at the same time a clairvoyant vision of the surroundings in which he has appeared in this way both the psychic and those who perceive the created figure mutually exchange experiences and this process should be continued until the projected double becomes so solid in structure that it cannot be distinguished from a real physical being there are many advanced psychic students who claim that they can actually create and project to great distances material bodies of this nature end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by amanda friday your psychic powers and how to develop them by harroward carrington chapter twenty eight haunted houses as explained in the last chapter when apparitions become fixed or attached to one locality they constitute what is called a local haunting and the place they influence is commonly called a haunted house this is the ordinary or common theory of haunted houses and the average person probably assumes that the figures seen in such houses are material and the picture he forms of the ghost is that it is a sheeted figure walking about up and down stairs and clanking chains after it there are probably a few if any psychic students who believe that houses are haunted by figures of this description and opposed to this view is that of ordinary science which contends that there are no haunted houses at all the figures seen within them being merely the product of expectancy suggestion and excited imagination the explanation of haunted houses all those who have carefully investigated the subject however come to the conclusion sooner or later that there are genuine haunted houses the question is what constitutes the haunting and how are such cases to be explained many psychic students have specialized so to speak in this subject of haunted houses and have formulated various theories to explain cases of this character the following are the most important theories which have been advanced one that one person or group of persons forming a family have experienced certain psychic phenomena in the house in question and these form the nucleus round which gathered impressions noises and psychic experiences of all kinds from a small beginning great results sprang elaborated by their own minds now when these people moved away from the house in question and other tenants occupied it this second group was influenced by the thoughts emotions and impressions of those who had moved away so that they in their turn began to see signs and hear strange sounds inquiry revealing the fact that the house had the reputation of being haunted and their own imaginations would magnify the significance of all they had seen or heard in other words this theory contends that telepathy or influence from living minds is the all-sufficient explanation and alone serves to account for the facts telepathy and psychic atmosphere two the second theory advanced is that telepathy from the dead is the true explanation the phantom scene etc being produced by the influence of minds of deceased persons on this theory the figures and phantoms are not objective or real any more than in the first case but are telepathic hallucinations just as truly though they have an objective basis of reality inasmuch as they have originated in the mind of a deceased person dreams or thoughts of the dead constitute therefore the basic principle of explanation on this theory three the next theory which is advanced is that some subtle psychic atmosphere permeates the walls of the house in question and that this atmosphere influences or impresses all those who live within it there is much to say in favor of such a theory and the previous chapters on the aura psychometry the human fluid etc will lend a certain amount of support to it at the same time it is difficult to see how a general and impersonal atmosphere of this character could translate itself into definite figures or forms 
particularly when these speak and convey information unknown to the seer. I shall say more of this later. Astral Bodies and Thought Forms 4. The fourth theory to be advanced is that the figures seen are the astral or etheric bodies of spirits who return and constitute the haunting, being present in actual fact. This is the nearest approach to the commonly held theory of the figures seen in haunted houses. 5. The fifth theory is that such figures are thought forms, created by some distant, living or disincarnate mind, and projected into the house in question, where they assume more or less definite and tangible form. This is, in a sense, a process of self-projection, but the phantasm is always seen in a certain place, as though magnetically drawn to that locality. THE NATURE OF THE FIGURE SEEN Which of these theories is the correct one? In my own estimation there is much truth in all of them, and no two cases of haunted houses are due to the same cause, or depend upon the same conditions. All five of these causes may be operating at the same time in any one house, or any two, three, or four of them may be. Indeed, to judge from the complex nature of the phenomena seen, it is highly probable that such is the case. There is strong evidence, in fact, to make us believe that the ordinary hallucination theories will not serve to explain the facts. For example, these phantasms often produce physical phenomena, as before explained, such as opening doors, lifting curtains, snuffing candles, etc. Mental images or pictures could not do this. Again, animals often see, or appear to see, apparitions in haunted houses, and show all the signs of fear, such as trembling, sweating, etc. In the third place, figures are often described differently by different individuals. For example, A would describe a full-face view of the figure, while B would describe the figure in profile. If a real figure were standing where both percipients saw it, this description would be correct. Such cases certainly tend to suggest that a real figure, and no mere hallucination, was present. In the fourth place, apparitions have been seen by two, three, or more persons at once. These collective hallucinations, as they are called, strongly suggest an external phantom in no mere mental picture. Proofs of Reality In the fifth place, apparitions which have appeared to strangers occupying haunted houses have afterwards been identified on being shown the photograph of the person. For example, a gentleman sleeping in a house, reputed to be haunted, sees a certain figure bending over him when he awakes at midnight. He notes details of dress, feature, etc., and also notes that he has never seen this person before in his life. The next day he is shown twenty photographs. From among the twenty he selects one as being the phantom seen in the house. The owner of the house then tells him that this is the person said to haunt the locality in question. Again we are driven to believe that more than mere hallucination is at work. In the sixth place, these figures, seen in haunted houses, have occasionally been photographed, and this objective and physical proof of their reality is strong evidence that they are more than mental products. Seventh, figures seen in haunted houses often convey, to the seer, definite information or give messages which the individual in question could not have known. This strongly indicates not only the reality of the apparition, but the fact that it is a disincarnate spirit. For these reasons, therefore, we must assume that haunted houses are actual realities, and that the figures seen therein are, at times at least, outstanding entities, and represent more or less directly the individual they appear to portray. Seances in Haunted Houses Psychic students can test their power, and at the same time conduct many interesting and valuable experiments in haunted houses. In an atmosphere of this sort, which is more highly charged with magnetism than the ordinary seance room, psychic powers of any character should be quickly augmented and increased, so that messages could be obtained by speech, vision, automatic writing, crystal vision, etc. Whenever you hear of a case of a haunted house, therefore, you should make it a point to visit this house at once. It is not necessary to sleep in it a night, as many suppose, in order to test its character. Hold a seance in that house in the evening, and striking phenomena will probably result. Or, if you cannot gather together a group of interested students, sit by yourself, and see whether you cannot obtain direct messages from the intelligences present. Experiments in automatic writing, crystal gazing, etc. may also be tried. Clairvoyant Diagnosis of Haunted Houses Clairvoyance may also render useful service by visiting clairvoyantly haunted houses and ascertaining and describing, if possible, the source and cause of the haunting. Visit the house by means of a clairvoyant excursion, either spontaneously or when in a mesmeric trance, etc. 
and use your psychic powers to the utmost to discover what you can regarding this house when you find yourself inside it look about and see whether you can sense any spirits evil or otherwise lurking among its atmosphere endeavor to sense the psychic atmosphere of the house and test the aura of those living within it all houses reputed to be haunted may not necessarily be so but the individuals themselves may be unbalanced or obsessed for some reason in which case the house itself would be free except from those influences which were drawn to it by the individuals residing there many persons living in haunted houses wish to be free from the depressing influences which sometimes hang about houses of this character yet do not know how to proceed in order to rid themselves of these haunting presences this is a very complicated question and one to which psychic students have in the past given far too little attention in my book the coming science there is a chapter entitled haunted houses and their cure and i would refer all those interested to the work in question an interesting case is there given of a haunted house which was cured so to say by the following means how to cure haunted houses a trance medium georgia gladys cooley was called in to investigate and do what she could and when in the house went spontaneously into trance in that condition her guide spoke through her and described the haunting spirits they were then charged to remove them if possible and undertook to do so this they did in a somewhat striking and dramatic manner and ended by reporting the fact that the haunting presences had been finally completely removed this is a very instructive case and shows us that trans mediums and their guides can be of a very great service in many cases where the haunting assumes an unpleasant or evil character thus the nature of the haunting may be diagnosed clairvoyantly and the cure effected through some trans medium and by the spirits who operate through him in some cases however the haunting may be cured by more simple means such as suggestion lessening the psychic sensitiveness of those living in the house by diverting the thoughts by plenty of outdoor physical exercise toughening the aura etc on the other hand there are cases on record where haunted houses have withstood all attempts to cure them and the inhabitants have ultimately been forced to move happily cases of this character are rare at all events haunted houses present a fascinating and useful field in which the psychic student can test his clairvoyance or other psychic power to advantage end of chapter 28 recording by amanda friday chapter 29 of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by arnie horton your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Heroward Carrington Chapter 29 The Difficulties of Communication The process of communication is doubtless far more difficult and complicated than the average person believes, and is even more complicated than most spiritualists believe. As stated in a previous chapter, one of the great objections to the reality of spiritualism urged in the past is that if true many more persons must communicate than now appear to do so and that of the thousands who die more must come back than the few who return through mediums it was there pointed out that the reason for this consists partly in the fact that quote, good communicators unquote, are comparatively rare and that there is necessarily a peculiar psychical condition which enables them to communicate through mediums in addition to this a medium must be present at the time that an effort to communicate is being made and in many cases the recipient of the message must also be reaching out to receive it before it can be given satisfactorily in other words the sender and the receiver of the message must stretch out their quote, mental arms unquote so to say at the same moment before they can shake hands across the great gulf and if only one does so he fails to reach the one on the other side factors affecting communication it has frequently been pointed out by scientific investigators of spiritualism that only after the reality of the facts has been proved does their detailed study begin for example supposing that a spirit can write through an entranced medium she giving the messages in automatic writing the fact once admitted 
the scientific study of the case will only have begun and such questions as these would then have to be answered to what extent is the medium spirit disconnected from the body while the communication is taking place what is the degree of mental activity of the medium spirit during the communication does the communicating intelligence act directly on the brain and nervous centers of the medium or in a more roundabout manner and if the former upon what brain centers does the intelligence act and how if a communicator was in life a good visualizer or had a good memory etc would these factors assist him in the process of communication and if so how these and many similar questions would have to be answered and it is upon questions such as these that many psychical researchers have bent their energies for some time past it is probable that several hundred years will have to elapse before these questions can be answered fully and the facts explained in detail difficulties of the communicating spirit let us enumerate some of the difficulties which a communicating spirit probably has to contend with in sending messages through mediums to the living there is much evidence to show that the process of communication is a very difficult one for as soon as a spirit gets in contact with the medium and begins to transmit messages he becomes more or less exhausted and suffocated so to speak by the dense aura or atmosphere with which he is called upon to come into contact in many instances we read that spirits have to go away several times during the course of a seance to revive themselves and afterwards return refreshed and clear-brained to continue the communications they experience great difficulty in holding their thoughts together connectedly during the process of communication this does not mean that they are ordinarily in this confused state but very often as soon as they come into contact with the medium's psychic atmosphere and magnetism they become confused and their minds tend to wander as they would in delirium or in a state of trance it is because of this that many of the messages we receive commence well but afterwards dwindle off into incoherence and triviality why many messages are quote, trivial unquote. this question of quote, triviality unquote, however is often misunderstood the objection is raised that spirits if they really communicate would tell us something more important than they usually do as a matter of fact however this is only true in a certain sense the ordinary social conversation between quote, spirits in the flesh unquote, is not as serious as it might be and it has been shown by actual experiment that human beings when called upon to prove their own identity to another do deliberately choose trivial incidents by means of which to identify themselves another point is that trivial incidents serve best to prove identity as some great philosophical discourse might be given by any intelligence either in or out of the body and would prove nothing to one longing to hear from his own dear one in such a case personal detailed and so to say trivial messages are often the most striking and the most convincing the very triviality of many messages received through mediums is therefore their strongest point and not their weakest in addition to this there are as we know innumerable books written by spirits containing philosophical scientific and religious truths of great value and importance influence of the medium's organism another reason why communication is doubtless difficult is that the communicating spirit is unused to the bodily organism of the medium all of us have certain mental and physical habits which we form and it is easier for us to do certain things in certain ways after we have done them in that manner a few times if you were suddenly transplanted into the body of another person say one of the opposite sex you would find great difficulty in manipulating that body so as to extract from it the best results to think clearly and to speak and write clearly when expressing your thoughts it is precisely this difficulty which the communicating intelligence experiences in trying to communicate with us through unfamiliar bodies many of the habits and quote, tricks unquote, so to say 
of the medium creep into the messages which are consequently often more or less similar to the language employed by the medium this proves only that the spirit has to employ the medium's mental and bodily habits as best it can during the process of communication and that it is not as easy and concise as many persons imagine symbolism necessary another difficulty presented is that the conditions on the quote, other side unquote, are doubtless so different from any which exist here that they have to be explained in roundabout and symbolic language if you had to explain color to a blind man you would find great difficulty in doing so if you had to explain the feelings experienced while giving psychometric tests to one who had never experienced them you would also find considerable difficulty it is much the same in this case there are no immediate analogies which can be drawn and the result is that symbolism and a language which appears to us vague and unsatisfactory is often employed in describing the other side of life and the conditions which prevail therein difficulties of names and dates names and dates furnish great difficulty for returning spirits dates because of the fact that time is not recognized by them in the same way that it is with us names for the reason that they do not represent concrete pictures or meanings but are as a rule only a combination of letters having a certain sound the word quote, chair unquote, calls up to the mind a certain picture which can be visualized on the other hand the name quote, robinson unquote, calls up no such picture except perhaps the memory image of some friend of yours by that name if that memory picture is revived in the communicator's mind the medium can see this and describe it which is precisely what he does but the name quote, robinson unquote, cannot be presented in picture form the most common form of representation and consequently is not easily communicated as explained in the chapter on dreams our hearing centers are less developed than our sight centers and for this reason verbal messages are less easily given and received than pictured or visualized messages the difficulty in receiving names is explained largely because of this fact communications immediately after death for some days after death these difficulties are particularly great and especially in the case of suicides dr hodgson in his report of the case of mrs piper says quote, that persons just deceased should be extremely confused and unable to communicate directly or even at all seems perfectly natural after the shock and wrench of death thus in one case the spirit was unable to write the second day after his death in another case a friend of mine whom i may call d wrote with what appeared to be much difficulty his name and the words i am all right adieu within two or three days after his death in another case f he was unable to write on the morning after his death a few days later when a stranger was present with me for a sitting he wrote two or three sentences saying i am too weak to articulate clearly and not many days later he wrote fairly well and quite accurately dictating also to madame eliza the amanuensis an account of his feelings when finding himself amid new surroundings both d and f became very clear in a short time d communicated frequently later on both by writing and speech end quote. other difficulties other difficulties remain such as the probable inability of the communicating spirit to see the material world as we see it especially at the time of communication the difficulty of holding the mind together while communicating the difficulty of manipulating the medium's organism and the intracosmic difficulties which exist between this world and the next because of all these hindrances and impediments spirits find great difficulty in direct communication and because of these facts messages are comparatively speaking few and in so many cases inconclusive when a good medium a good communicator and a sympathetic sitter get together however very striking and convincing results are obtained as we know from the history of spiritualism 
End of chapter 29. Chapter 30 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Smith. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hare Uward Carrington. Chapter 30 Hypnotism and mesmerism the word mesmerism is derived from anton mesire who founded the system and who performed all the early experiments in this field it was known as mesmerism for about fifty years until an english physician by the name of dr james braid coined a new word hypnotism from the greek hypnos sleep and this is the word which has been used almost exclusively from that date to this. The difference between hypnotism and mesmerism. The majority of persons would claim at the present day that hypnotism and mesmerism are identical, there being no difference between them. They are both due, it is said, to suggestion and the influence of the mind over the body very similar phenomena occur in both cases it is true but i believe that there is a difference between the two processes and conditions mesmerism is based on the belief that there is a definite physical emanation or vital fluid which passes from the operator into the subject while the mesmeric passes are being made over the latter's body hypnotism on the other hand is due entirely to suggestion the influence of the subconscious mind upon the body there is no physical influence or effluence in hypnotic practice and it is claimed that all the phenomena of mesmerism apparently showing such influence are in reality entirely due to suggestion as before stated however we believe that there is a difference between the two processes and that hypnotism is due solely to physical causes but that in mesmerism the human fluid before spoken of plays a part as proof of this i may cite among other proofs the fact that clairvoyance and many of the so-called higher phenomena are frequently obtained in mesmeric trance while there are extremely rare in hypnotic trance other phenomena could be mentioned but this will suffice for the present mesmerism being due to the passage of a vital fluid from the body of the operator into the subject contact and passes are essential if therefore you wish to mesmerize your subject you should make passes over his head forehead eyes and down the front of the body all downward passes are sleep passes and all upward passes are walking passes placing the hands on certain nerve centers of the forehead and particularly between the eyes and over the temples will help to induce sleep also clasping the patient's hands and placing the point of your thumb in contact with the point of his thumb establishes the current and serves to induce the mesmeric trance in hypnotism on the other hand passes are not essential though often help in hypnotizing a subject it is common to ask him first of all to gaze at a bright object until his eyes tire when the lids are closed suggestions of sleep are given or the subject may open and close the eyes a number of times as you count and this will serve to induce the initial stages of hypnotic trance the deeper stages are induced by means of suggestion post hypnotic suggestion is a form of treatment often resorted to and is a good subject for experimentation it means that the subject performs after awaking from trance certain actions suggested to him when entranced he remembers nothing of the suggestions 
but carries them out to the letter many hypnotic subjects have extraordinary ability in calculating time and can guess to a second the length of time which has elapsed between certain intervals or carry out post hypnotically a suggestion given them in trance days or even weeks before hypnotism is a useful method of opening up and exploring the subconscious mind we are enabled to tap it as it were and get in touch with hidden portions of our being which we could otherwise never reach dreams may be analyzed in this manner also unpleasant thoughts impressions emotions etc removed and frequently undesirable influences banished by hypnotic suggestion hypnotism seems to reach a deeper stratum of our mind than ordinary waking suggestion and because of this fact it is at times so useful for instance the drink habit has often been cured by hypnotic suggestion hence we see that there must be more in the hypnotic command than mere advice or persuasion because of thousands of drunkards have been advised not to drink but they continue to do so nevertheless by means of hypnotism we are enabled to reach a portion of the mind so deep that it controls the whole being and the result is that these deep-rooted habits may at times be removed and eradicated this is one of the distinguishing marks of the hypnotic state that a more fundamental control over the body and mind is obtained and by reason of this fact many cures of diseased conditions and abnormal states of mind have been recorded which have been otherwise treated ineffectively there is a difference between the hypnotic and the mediumistic trance though not so great as that existing between the latter and the mesmeric state in both the mediumistic and the mesmeric trance a form of magnetism is doubtless employed and this connects them in a subtle bond of union it is because of this that telepathy clairvoyance etc are so often obtained in the mesmeric trance which is closely akin to the condition secured by mediums in which they obtain genuine mediumistic messages the fear of being hypnotized many persons are afraid of being hypnotized this fear being based partly upon valid reasons and partly upon superstition properly induced by an expert the hypnotic trance is not injurious on the contrary it is often extremely beneficial and as before pointed out quickens the mental and physical powers removes bad habits effects cures etc on the other hand when hypnotism is applied by an ignorant or bungling operator who does not know his business the result may be very detrimental to the health of the person hypnotized a state may be induced which neither the operator nor anybody else fully understands for no one at the present time fully comprehends the nature of the condition thereby induced the conscious mind is removed from its supremacy and that this is often a fatal mistake particularly when there are evil influences at work either within or without the subject if the operator is a sympathetic careful and qualified expert mesmerism may prove highly beneficial for evil influences may thereby be removed by counteracting them and infusing into the subject a supply of beneficial animal magnetism which is opposed to that supplied from opposite sources hypnotic influence from other minds andrew jackson davis began his career as a medium by being mesmerized and others could doubtless develop their mediumistic faculties in the same way but one must be extremely careful in such a case to select a thoroughly competent operator one in whom he has complete faith otherwise more harm than good may result if you find that any one is trying to influence you against your will you may overcome this by a counter suggestion given to yourself from within if the person be absent this may be purely imaginary on your part 
and the operator in question may be entirely ignorant of the effect he is producing in you. There are thousands of persons in insane asylums all over the world who suffer from the belief that they are being persecuted by others at a distance, and that these others are endeavoring to influence them by hypnotism, etc. As a matter of fact, nothing of the sort is the case, and their condition is purely the result of imaginary belief. Be most careful, therefore, that you fully ascertain and prove to your satisfaction the existence of this foreign influence before you take any steps to offset it or even seriously believe that such influence is being directed towards you. How to Overcome Such Influences When once you have become satisfied that influences of this character are being directed towards you, take immediate steps to protect yourself, such as those outlined in Chapter 23 obsession and insanity. If promptly applied, this will effectively offset such conditions coming from outside minds. If you are in the presence of a person whom you feel to be influencing you, it would then be best to take the precautions and steps outlined in the next chapter, devoted to personal magnetism. This will prevent your passing under the influence of such a person. You need never fear that hypnotic sleep, even if induced, will last a great length of time, and that the subject cannot be awakened therefrom. Sleeps of this character always terminate spontaneously, if they are let alone, though it is always best to see that a hypnotic subject is thoroughly awakened before he leaves the care and supervision of the operator. Otherwise, he may go about in a somewhat dazed condition for a time, and may not be altogether responsible for his actions. An important warning. Somnambulism is a variation of hypnotic sleep where the subject spontaneously performs a number of complicated actions and the subconscious muscular activities play a large part. A person who is subject to somnambulistic attacks should never under any circumstances be awakened suddenly. It is a good plan to speak to such a person and suggest to him as to one in hypnotic trance that he returned to bed and this done suggests to him that it is impossible for such a condition to again occur etc somnambulistic attacks of this character may often be cured by hypnotic treatment and properly directed suggestion prevention of hypnotic influence an operator may prevent his subject from being hypnotized by any other person through forceful suggestions to his subject, that he will be enabled to resist suggestions from any other operator, that he will have no effect on him, etc. If you do not wish to be hypnotized at all, you may give similar suggestions to yourself. These self-suggestions are called auto-suggestions. Lightly given and persistently repeated, they will effectively prevent you from being influenced by any other person. End of chapter 30. Recording by John Smith. Chapter 31 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olenka. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harrowood Carrington. Personal Magnetism. We all know the difference between a positive and a negative personality between an individual who is naturally successful and one who is not. The former seems to attract to himself success, happiness and prosperity. The latter seems to repel it. It's not necessary for a naturally positive person to say anything or to perform any action in order to make us feel this power within him. It seems to radiate silently from him as a form of power. Many times, doubtless, we have all stepped into a room an elevator, etc., and immediately felt the strong personality and presence of an individual of this character, possessing much natural magnetism. They may know nothing of this power, perhaps hardly realize that they possess it, although they do, in many cases to a remarkable degree. Properly developed and utilized, this power helped to make the great names in history. We may, all of us, cultivate and develop this power to a great extent by proper practice 
and the degree to which we can develop it will make us successful accordingly, not only in the material things of this world, but will also enable us to achieve mental and spiritual heights which the ordinary person cannot attain. The inexhaustible supply. We must constantly bear in mind that there is an unlimited supply of cosmic energy and this will develop personal magnetism to the degree to which we can draw upon it. Exercises for doing so have been given in a previous chapter. We must have confidence in ourselves and in our powers. For confidence in self breeds confidence in others and fear weakens both the brain that plans and the hand that executes. We must use suggestion rightly in our conversation with others and without appearing to do so, constantly give such suggestions as are likely to take root in the mind. And this must be hammered in by constant repetition. Finally, we must not waste the magnetism we may possess by nervous habits, such as tapping on the floor or table with the fingers, pacing up and down the room, etc. In short, all unnecessary gestures. If we save our energy in this way, it is the same as if we received more of it, and this we can utilize to good account. The physical factor. Personal magnetism depends upon various factors. First of all, sound physical health is essential. Without it, there is little virility, and upon the presence of this vital stamina, success largely depends. Theodore Roosevelt's dominating personality was due largely to his extraordinary physical energy. Large muscles are not necessarily a sign of this. It is the vital constitution which must be strengthened, and in order to accomplish this, the internal organs must be in a healthy condition. Proper exercises devoted to stimulating their function should be taken for a few minutes daily, and in this connection the student would do well to consult one or two good books on physical culture, giving directions of this character. Bending movement of all kinds are especially helpful. Deep breathing exercises, which tend to expand the lungs, chest and diaphragm, are to be recommended. And if you can stimulate the solar plexus and internal organs by deep breathing exercises, this will go a long way towards rousing the vital currents of the body. The inner physical causes for this will be explained more fully in subsequent chapters. The mental factor. Next, the mind must be trained and cultivated in certain directions and channels. Just here, the student would do well to turn back and reread the directions given in Chapter 7, Self and Soul Culture, where practical advice on success and its attainment is given. The practice of concentration, Chapter 24, would prove very helpful here. Relaxation both of body and mind should follow this. The improvement of memory by various methods would greatly add to the strength of the psychic personality, since it is upon memory that the thread of personality depends. Attention upon any given subject should be cultivated, and you should never allow yourself to perform any action automatically which should be conscious. For instance, if you put an object in the drawer of your desk, make a conscious mental note of this at the time, so that you afterward remember where it is placed, and never allow yourself to place the object there without paying particular attention to it. Many people do this, and it is indicative of a weak power of attention and a scattered mind. The degree to which you can overcome this indicates concentration and hence power. Nothing gives power and strength to the mind so much as continued exercise and concentration. The spiritual factor. Spiritual development will also assist in the cultivation of personal magnetism by drawing to your aid certain spiritual energies which recharge you, that is, charge your body in much the same way that an electric motor is charged by external energy. This power you draw by placing yourself in a certain receptive condition which invites its influx. All negative thoughts tend to erect a wall between yourself and helpful external guidance, and on the other hand, an affirmative and positive attitude will have the effect of attracting or drawing to you this additional power. Thoughts and emotions also have this effect. If you will carefully analyze your own inner sensations while thinking certain thoughts or experiencing certain emotions, you will find that selfish, self-centered impulses tend to contract you mentally and physically. You feel yourself tightening up all over, as it were, and this internal action shuts off all outside aid and influence. On the other hand, if you think thoughts of friendship, love, etc., you will find your beings tends to expand, and it is this feeling which opens the gates of your soul to an influx of higher power. How to influence others. Personal magnetism is practically useful in the affairs of this life. 
If you wish to achieve a certain object, you will far more likely to do so if you have a good magnetic personality than otherwise. The following simple rules, if followed, will probably greatly assist you in the development of personal magnetism. 1. Just before entering into the presence of the person whom you are about to interview, call up that person's image before your mind and assume toward it a positive mental attitude. If you do this, you will carry over and maintain this attitude towards that person when you meet him. If you assume at the outset 60 or 75 percent of the mental dominance or initiative, you, figuratively speaking, only leave the other person 40 or 25 percent of the ground lying between you which he can possibly occupy. Your business is to assume at the outset as large a percentage of the positive relationship as possible and by doing so you force the other person to assume the minor quantity. The use of the eyes too. When in the presence of the person whom you are to interview, look him squarely in the eyes and hold his gaze and attention until you have won your first point. If possible, do not allow his attention or his eyes to wander from you until you have thoroughly ensured his interest and sympathetic cooperation. It is important to catch the eye at the moment you are making a particular point, so as to drive it home, as it were. You cannot stare a person in the eye all the while you are talking to him, and you should look away part of the time, when you are discussing unimportant points or leading up to the climax. Many salesmen utilize this principle in making a sale. They will draw attention to a book or an illustration at which they ask you to look and talk about it for a moment. Then close the book and make a short, quick remark which will draw your attention to his face and eyes spontaneously. At the moment when he has gained your full attention and you are in a condition to receive any statement he will make to you, he will come to the climax of his argument and perhaps ask you to sign a certain paper which you may be prevailed upon to do under the influence of his personality. How to develop the magnetic gaze the eyes, therefore, play an important part in the cultivation of personal magnetism, and you should cultivate and strengthen them by certain exercises which will certainly develop them. For example, practice gazing steadily at an object for several seconds without allowing the gaze or the attention to wander and without blinking the eyes. At first you will probably be able to do so for only a short time, but this will gradually be extended as you cultivate the power. Next, practice gazing at a fairly bright object and continue this until you can look at it for several minutes at a time without becoming affected. When you look into the eyes of another person, do not look blankly, but will at the same time and throw the whole force of your personality into your gaze, feeling that you will influence that person to do as you wish. Naturally, practices of this character can be, and in fact are, utilized by many persons for evil as well as for good purposes. Those who are endeavoring to cultivate the higher side of their nature, however, will fully realize the necessity of utilizing any added powers they may gain for good purposes only. Passes and Suggestions 3. Downward passes, as before explained, are sleep passes and a few of these will add emphasis to your speech and impress the person to whom you are talking. Do not gesticulate over much, however, as this will detract rather than add to what you have to say. A few passes at the proper moments will prove of great value. 4. Do not speak hurriedly, for if you do you will give the impression that you are in a hurry, and your hearer will unconsciously grow impatient. On the other hand, do not drawl your words but speak naturally with a clear, forceful enunciation. The more reposeful and calm you appear, the more receptive your listener will be to hear what you have to say. At the same time, you must be businesslike and precise. How to prevent the influence of others. If you wish to offset the influence of someone who is speaking to you and prevent yourself from being influenced by him, you should see to it that you do not allow him to catch your eye at the psychological climax of the conversation, but studiously look away at that time and carefully think over and analyse what he is saying to you without allowing yourself to be swayed by his manner or words. Look at him in the intervals between these climaxes when he will probably be looking away from you. Hold your mind in a positive attitude and never allow yourself to be hurried into anything. The ability to say no and stick to it, when occasion demands, 
has been declared one of the greatest essentials to success by many men who have attained great eminence. As Abraham Lincoln once remarked, be sure you are right and then go ahead. A clear mind and inner mental repose will greatly add to your power in these directions. Helpful application. These exercises in the development of personal magnetism will be found especially helpful to all psychics for the reason that they tend to offset and counterbalance to a great extent the subjective practices of mediumship and hence balance up the personality by accentuating the objective as well as the subjective side of one's inner self. All those who are developing psychic powers in mediumship should, therefore, while leading their daily lives, endeavour to follow the principles herein laid down and develop their own natures along these lines. They will find that it will prove very helpful to them and preserve that just balance we term health. End of chapter 31「Chapter 32 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Phelps Gonzalez – Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 32 – Prophecy versus Fortune Telling the subject with which this chapter deals is a very important one for the spiritualist, for the psychic, and above all for the public medium, for the reason that it concerns him in a very practical manner. It would seem as if spiritualism, although an organized religious body, international in scope and influence, had no standing in the eyes of some people, nor that its accredited mediums were entitled to any more consideration than ordinary fortune-tellers. Fortune-telling, so-called, is against the law, and in many cities the authorities are very severe on anything which can in any way be construed as fortune-telling. Truly, one may be pardoned for believing that there is a power back of it which is opposed to so-called modernisms, to the several movements of a spiritual and religious nature that are freshly putting forth real knowledge of our true relations to this life and the life beyond. It is not merely a moral wave not merely ignorance of the difference between true and honest mediumship and fortune-telling, but an effort to retard and crush the truth. From the present standpoint of the court, Jesus, when he told the woman at the well about certain manners in her life, was a fortune-teller. The people marveled over him because of what he could tell and do. To spiritualists he was a medium, but a master, and one so qualified by time and distance as he comes down the centuries to the present age. In the twenty-first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul describes the gifts of the Spirit, or spiritual gifts, and says they are all of the same Spirit. The word Spirit here is used in the sense of a collective noun or a noun of multitude, much as we use the word Congress, and applies to the Spirit world as the source of inspiration and control, the same as with the spiritualist. Mediums and the Law There was much consulting with mediums in those early days of the primitive church. For does not Paul again say, Try the spirits, and see if they be of God. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Opposition stirs up opposition, and puts men and movements on the defensive. Spiritualism realizes this, and is now actively engaged in efforts for the better protection of its mediums. When one strikes a blow at modern spiritualism, he strikes a blow as well at ancient spiritual truth that truth which fills the pages of our Bible, for which the early martyrs died and upon which the Christian church was built. It comes as the comforter which Jesus said he would send in the latter days. An assistant district attorney once made a ruling that a sandwich constitutes a meal, and so liquor could be bought on Sunday. But no court can rule that a fortune-teller constitutes a spiritualistic medium, and have it stand. The letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. At the same time, prophecy is a genuine spiritual or mediumistic gift, and there are thousands of persons who have experienced so-called premonitions or provisions of the future, and have felt compelled to tell others what they have seen for them. Between prophecy and fortune-telling there is, therefore, a very fine line to be drawn, for the one is dependent upon superstition to a great extent, while the other is a genuine psychical faculty which requires our recognition and study. What Prophecy Is 
So far as we can define the distinction between the two, it may be said that prophecy depends upon internal spiritual promptings, or the reception of definite messages relating to the future which are told the medium by external spiritual intelligences. He acts merely as a medium for transmission in the latter case, and simply gives out what he receives. This is the type of spiritual premonition as distinct from clairvoyance of the future, which we have already discussed in chapter 14. In this latter case, the power appears to depend upon internal and spontaneous quickening of spiritual faculties, and seems to be self-originated, as it were. It is very similar to spontaneous premonitions, therefore, and in fact these subjects are so very closely connected that only an expert can define the differences between them. Unless one has had considerable experience and knowledge in this field, he is totally incapable of judging whether a given set of phenomena are the type of genuine prophecy or mere fortune-telling, and he should study the subject thoroughly before he is capable of expressing an opinion upon it. It may be well to consider the meaning of the word prophecy. It is derived from the Greek word prophemai, pro meaning before, and femai to say or tell. There is another word propheteuo of similar import and derivation, and means to prophecy, divine, foretell, predict, presage, to explain or apply prophecies. In Greek classical literature, the word prophet meant a declarer, foreteller, diviner, a harbinger, a forerunner, a priest, teacher, instructor, interpreter, a poet, a bard. All of these definitions carry with them something of the idea of a character whose mission is in some way connected with the aspirations and longings of mankind. A Definition of Prophecy The Standard Dictionary has defined prophecy as follows. 1. To predict or foretell, especially under divine inspiration and guidance. To prefigure, as to prophecy evil. 2. To speak or utter for God. 3. To speak by divine influence, or as a medium of communication between God and man. Specifically, to speak to men for God, declare or interpret the divine will. 4. To predict future events by supernatural influence, real or professed. To foretell the future utter predictions as to prophecy a disaster five archaic to interpret scripture explain religious subjects preach exhort under the head of synonyms the standard dictionary gives augur define foretell predict prognosticate prophecy differs from predict by assuming a claim to supernatural or divine inspirations to prognosticate is to predict from observed signs, indications, or conditions. To prophecy in the scriptural sense is to utter religious truths under divine inspiration, not simply always to foretell future events, but to warn, exhort, comfort, etc. by special message or impulse from God. This scriptural definition seems well adapted to the spiritualist sense of the word when we interpret God to mean the infinite spirit of good. The verb prophecy is also used in the New Testament in the sense of revealing something which had happened and was unknown to the person revealing it, except through some so-called supernatural source. As, for instance, after Jesus was pronounced guilty of death by the high priest, some of the ruffians, who have their counterpart in this day, spat in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with palms of their hands, saying, Prophecy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Matthew chapter 26, verse 65 to 68. Jesus ignored this challenge. Could they have understood, or would they have believed in his mission, if he had correctly pointed out the man who had assaulted him? Explanation of Fortune-Telling It is true, however, that the method of arriving at the knowledge given is, in itself, an indication of the character of the knowledge imparted. Thus, fortune-telling in the hands of charlatans and quacks is often connected with such superstitious practices as reading the future from tea or coffee grounds, from cards, allowing birds to pick out envelopes containing written messages relating to the future, etc. Such practices are certainly to be deprecated by every sincere spiritualist and truth-seeker, though it should be said just here that many psychics who read the cards in this manner depend not so much on the actual fall of the cards as upon the psychic impressions which they receive at the time the sitter's fortune is being told this is often true also in the case of palmists there is doubtless some truth to the general doctrine of palmistry but it can only hold good to a very limited extent 
when impressions are received the process is somewhat akin to crystal gazing where the mind is concentrated on an external object while it remains passive and open to internal impressions but instead of receiving these in the form of visual pictures they are given in a more general and vague manner why fortune telling is sometimes true on the other hand genuine mediumistic messages are frequently given while the subject is reading the cards examining the sitter's palm etc it will be observed that in these cases there is a certain fundamental reality in the phenomena but it is perverted and unconsciously covered up by the seer who is unaware of the actual source of the information he gives psychic power or mediumship is the basis of the supernormal information given but it is under the guise of fortune-telling a far more direct and satisfactory method would be to come out in a straightforward and direct manner and state that each and such impressions were received relating to the future and this premonitory faculty could doubtless be cultivated by certain practices and be used as the student progressed in his psychic development exercises for development of these faculties will be given later on in this book why mediums cannot help themselves disbelievers in spiritualism often say if your assertions are true why do not the spirits warn and advise you more frequently and why do they not help you financially or otherwise more than they do the answer is simply as before said that you are not a creator but an instrument a knife may be sharp but it could not cut bread without the power behind it a soldier may go to war and fight bravely without knowing the real reasons for the war you are the knife or the soldier you cannot act by yourself or achieve desirable results unless the power be imparted to you from beyond and even then the power is supplied for other purposes and centered upon other things the knife does not cut itself but the bread clairvoyant power does not benefit the clairvoyant directly but some third person and in cases where the student has found it possible to pervert its use and turn it into selfish channels the power has invariably been lost it may also be said that spiritualists may err in the selection of spirit advisers as well in their mediums of intercommunication that is true for we are not endowed with perfect judgment even in selecting in this life our medical or legal advisers or our governmental representatives and officials our business partners or our friends or the person to advise us as to where we can get the best advice in a given manner the spiritualist merely claims the right to act for himself without let or hindrance from those who differ with him in religious views if he makes mistakes which cause him loss or suffering it must be remembered that even jesus with his extraordinary psychic powers made a mistake when he selected judas iscariot as one of the twelve if it be said that this seeming mistake was a part of the divine plan then it may also be said that the spiritualist seeming mistakes may also be part of a divine plan history of prophecy there can be no doubt that prophecy has existed in all ages and has had its own uses as well as its abuses many spiritualists believe that prophecy is invariably connected with spirits and that the explanation depends upon their communication on the other hand many orthodox religious persons believe that prophecy depends entirely upon the influx of the divine spirit and that the ability to predict or foretell comes directly from god this is the manner in which it is regarded by many people and many religious books there are many references to prophecy and to prophets both in the old and the new testament and any one who accepts the teachings of the bible as in any way true and valuable can hardly fail to believe that prophecy is a genuine psychical faculty which has been exercised by men in all ages and is undoubtedly being exercised by them now thus in first corinthians chapter four verse three we read but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort again in the same chapter verse one we read follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts but rather that ye may prophesy and again in the same chapter verses thirty one thirty two and thirty nine we read for ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets wherefore brethren covet to prophecy and forbid not to speak with tongues one more quotation in first corinthians chapter twelve verse four through twelve we read now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit and there are differences of administrations but the same lord 
and there are diversities of operations but it is the same god which worketh all in all but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all for to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another the gift of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discernings of spirit to another diverse kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit abiding in every man as he will many other references of this character could be given but it is hardly necessary for every student knows that every religious book in the world accepts the genuineness of prophecy and in fact all religions are based on the revelations of seers or prophets how is prophecy possible prophecy is a faculty which usually comes unsought and spontaneously when the future is seen in an isolated picture or event it is usually called a premonition or prevision and many examples of this character have been collected and published by the societies for psychical research it may be asked how is it possible to see into the future to lift the veil of futurity and glance forward as we glance backward in reading history certainly at first sight such a thing appears not only impossible but absurd nevertheless it is an undoubted fact and numbers of cases of this character might perhaps be explained more or less rationally even with our present knowledge thus certain types of premonitions relate to the future of welfare of the body or health of the subject experiencing them in such cases we might suppose that the subconscious mind which has a wider range of inner experience and knowledge than the ordinary waking mind was aware of certain internal changes and happenings of which the conscious mind was totally ignorant in such cases the explanation would be that this subconscious mind having acquired this knowledge would merely impart or externalize it in the form of a vision voice or message or in the form of automatic writing etc a second type of premonition might depend upon subconscious inference and deduction thus being far more accurate and far-seeing than the conscious mind in such matters particularly when the latter is occupied with everyday practical affairs another set of premonitions might be accounted for by assuming that the knowledge given is imparted telepathically or gained clairvoyantly by the subject's own mind in these cases the information would be in the minds of other living persons and would be gained from them and given out before the subject had gained the fact normally scientific explanation of prophecy a fourth type of premonition might be explained by assuming that discarnate spirits play a large part and communicate the information to the recipient of the message in question in this case the discarnate intelligence would have to be in possession of certain facts or be enabled to see farther than the psychic himself and there is much evidence that this is in fact the case on numerous occasions for example if we see a spider walking across the table we know that when it reaches the edge it will either stop or fall over though the spider cannot foresee these facts and continues to walk quite ignorant of the fate in store of it again use a more forceful example supposing a friend of yours is walking down the street and is coming to a cross street down which a strong wind is blowing being in possession of this knowledge you can predict with more or less certainty that when your friend reaches this cross street that his hat will blow off and in fact this actually happens now you will see in this case your ability to predict this fact or partly see into the future was based on your larger knowledge of certain factors playing about his life it is only logical to suppose therefore that spirits who may be and probably are in possession of greater psychic powers than we can foresee tendencies and destinies to a certain extent towards which human beings are tending this being so they are enabled at times to communicate perhaps telepathically statements regarding the future which often turn out to be true this would be a logical explanation of many cases of premonition of this type and would explain to us in a perfectly simple manner why it is that mistakes and errors so often occur in premonitions of this kind it would only be what we should expect it must be admitted however that there are many cases of premonitions which cannot be explained in this simple way and which we cannot in any manner account for in the present state of science and of our limited knowledge of psychic phenomena these cases we must simply record and hope that the time may come some day 
when we will be enabled to comprehend clearly the underlying causal explanation which will make clear to us the real mechanisms by means of which premonitions and prophecies are fulfilled end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by pamela krantz your psychic powers and how to develop them by harroward carrington chapter thirty three reincarnation and eastern philosophy most religious philosophies of the east are based on the reality of reincarnation or the embodiment of the same soul in a variety of physical bodies living on this earth at various stages of the world's history often separated from each other by a number of years the doctrine contends that the same individuality is maintained throughout all these lives as a background but that each life is also an individual experience which is destined to teach the soul one or more particular lessons which it needed to learn for the purposes of its ultimate progression and perfection the doctrine is based largely upon the law of compensation which says that inasmuch as there is in this life so much obvious inequality as regards the material returns rewards and happiness there must be another chance for that soul at another time and under other circumstances and that the poverty and other conditions which may be present in this life are for a purpose and teach a lesson and that quite possibly in some past life the same individual has been extraordinarily wealthy and has misused the riches and power entrusted to him the memory of past lives this is a fascinating doctrine and one which at first sight asks us to yield our consent to it yet there are many objections to this theory of reincarnation as we shall see presently it may be well to answer here one main objection to the doctrine which is sure to be advanced by the ordinary critic and this is that if the same soul be reincarnated a number of times it should remember its past lives while as a matter of fact it rarely does so and if we are to profit or benefit by these in any way one would think that this memory would be absolutely essential the theosophist or reincarnationist replies to this however by stating that each life is intended to be an individual separate existence without a memory bond or connection with any previous life the soul of the individual which reincarnates only reaps the knowledge of each life after death when this knowledge is added to the total mass of experiences already gained thus the individual human life is conceived to be greater than any single life just as a bucket of water is composed of thousands of drops each drop being separate until merged with others into the whole in the same way each individual life representing a separate drop would be individualized until after death when it is again merged into the total personality our inability to remember former lives is accounted for by assuming that there is no direct connection between the total self and the self which is built up in this life through the physical brain they are separated though it would take too long to explain here exactly the nature and causes of this separation according to the doctrines advanced the arguments for reincarnation another argument which is advanced in favor of the doctrine of reincarnation and to many minds a very strong one is that life must necessarily be eternal and immortal inasmuch as it is indestructible by death and continues to exist to all eternity in the future and for the same reason it must also have existed from eternity in the past and it is inconceivable that such a thing as an individual human spirit should continue to exist for ever after the moment of birth while it did not exist at all previous to that event these are the main arguments which are brought forward in favor of the doctrine of reincarnation and we may add to these one argument based upon experimental evidence it is this 
that many of those who have progressed sufficiently in their psychic development can so they say remember their past lives either fractions of them or incidents in them or the whole life may be remembered as a consecutive series of scenes and events many of the leaders of theosophy and other religious systems of this character contend that they can actually do so the majority of spiritualists however are opposed to this view and contend that reincarnation is not a fact though it must be admitted that in the past there has been a great diversity of opinion on this subject the french school of spiritists formerly headed by allan kardec contends that reincarnation is a fact and kardec's work the spirits book is based entirely upon teachings of spirits who claim that reincarnation is true on the other hand the majority of german english and american mediums contend that reincarnation is not true and spirits who return through them also assert emphatically that it is not a fact the reason of this apparent contradiction was explained in an earlier chapter the communicators merely stated their own views and opinions reasons for doubting reincarnation now in considering this doctrine of reincarnation there are certain factors which we must bear in mind one the average scientific inquirer begins by doubting the reality of survival at all and contends that nothing persists after the change called death for him it is annihilation the first point to be proved therefore is that anything at all exists after death and the phenomena of spiritualism are the only ones which prove this as before pointed out until it is thoroughly established that spirit of any character continues to exist after death it is useless to argue whether or not such a spirit is reincarnated for the reason that the average skeptic would contend that there is no such thing as a spirit to reincarnate until this primary fact of spirit existence is proved therefore it is useless to argue concerning this question of reincarnation two assuming that this is granted still there is no proof that reincarnation is a fact if we demand proof in the scientific sense of the world in order to establish such a doctrine as this a tremendous mass of testimony would be necessary far more than the ordinary phenomena of spiritualism which claim to establish a comparatively simple truth yet as a matter of fact there is far less evidence as we all know for the reality of reincarnation than there is for spirit return as the strength of the evidence should be proportioned to the strangeness of the facts it will be seen that we are as yet very far from proving reincarnation according to this standard a vast mass of well-attested evidence would have to be forthcoming and this has not been produced three it is not necessarily true that because the human spirit continues to exist for all eternity in the future it must necessarily have existed from all eternity in the past physics teaches us that a body set in motion comes to rest because of the hindrance or friction from outside forces acting upon it if there be no friction to retard such a body it would theoretically go on forever in a straight line once give a ball an initial push and provided there is no friction it would roll on forever without coming to a stop it might well be therefore that the human spirit once initiated would continue in the same fashion since we can see no hindrances to its progress resembling those acting in our physical world again a speck of mud thrown off from a revolving wheel only exists as an individual speck after it was thrown off in this manner before it was a part of the general mass assuming therefore that an individual human spirit is in some way separated and individualized at birth from the general stock of cosmic life energy at the moment of conception it might be that it continued as an individual thing thereafter for all eternity without necessarily having existed as such in the past the spiral or vortex of life in the next place assuming that life is an individualized force we can quite conceive that this force ascending in a series of spirals tends to become more detached and individualized with each revolution through which it passes 
and that ultimately it will tend to become detached and thrown off as it were from the vortex of life as an individual being birth might represent this process and again we see that it is not necessary to suppose that human spirit must have existed in the past because it continues to exist in the future as to the law of compensation already mentioned this is not really an argument but rather an emotional belief based upon the idea of justice but in the first place this may not necessarily be true and in the second even supposing that it is the same result is reached in other religions for according to the teachings of orthodox christianity the reward of the poor but righteous is in heaven and according to spiritualistic philosophy it depends on individual progress and effort how we remember past lives the doctrine of reincarnation cannot therefore be said to present a logical justification for the belief there remains the more substantial foundation based upon the before-mentioned experimental proof namely that many persons claim that they can remember portions of their past lives and even that they can remember the whole of them these latter cases however are very rare and the material from which one could form one's judgment regarding such cases has never been published owing to the lack of respectable evidence in this direction therefore we may assume for the present and until proof to the contrary be forthcoming that such cases depend not upon reality but upon elaborate subconscious imaginations and romances which these individuals have constructed within themselves as the result of brooding and thinking over possible past lives of their own there are many analogies for this belief and in some cases at least it has been proved beyond all question of doubt that these past lives were in reality fictitious and that the memory of them so called was certainly and purely subconscious imagination those who may be interested in obtaining this proof are referred to professor flournoy's book from india to the planet mars where and how these memories originate there remains those cases far less satisfactory and convincing but far more numerous in which isolated incidents of past lives have been remembered or in which scenes have flashed up before the mind together with the impression amounting to a certainty that the individual has experienced or lived through that scene before most cases of this character may be explained in a perfectly natural manner and do not afford any direct proof of the doctrine of reincarnation let me explain a few of the causes which may be operating inducing such apparent memories of past lives in the first place many of them are due to so-called illusions or hallucinations of memory so-called pseudo presentiments in which the event and the feeling that it has transpired become reversed or transposed in the mind so that one remembers the impression as occurring before the real event while in reality it happened afterward that this occurs in many cases has been scientifically proved in the second place dreams or subconsciously noted impressions which never come into consciousness may suddenly flash up in connection with a certain mental event and this would give rise to a feeling true in a sense that we had experienced it before we had but in a dream and not in a previous life thirdly many experiences conversations etc overseen or overheard before the age of four when the personality is in the process of formation and when consecutive memory and consciousness of self is said to begin may be remembered as isolated experiences and these may also give rise to the impression that we had seen them or experienced them before again this is a fact but it was not in a previous life lastly there are many cases in which the subconscious mind noted a scene or event a fraction of second or perhaps several seconds or even minutes before the conscious mind did and when the latter became aware of it there would again be this sense of familiarity and the feeling that we had seen or experienced this event before this is true but it was only a short time before the actual experience for all these reasons therefore and others which it would take too long to give 
the majority of spiritualists and psychical researchers do not at present regard the doctrine of reincarnation as true or in any way adequately proved and prefer to believe until this proof be forthcoming that the individual human spirit is initiated at birth builds up its own life by its own efforts and experiences and that it continues to improve upon this life by continuous striving after it has reached the spiritual world in the same manner that it does here on earth end of chapter thirty three reincarnation and eastern philosophy recording by pamela Krantz. chapter thirty four of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cynthia sheeler your psychic powers and how to develop them by herward carrington chapter thirty four the ethics of spiritualism as explained at the beginning of this book of instruction spiritualism is not only a scientific question but it is also a philosophical and a religious question it is approachable from the point of view of phenomena also that of theology and ethics the student who has followed the work thus far has doubtless progressed to some extent in the understanding if not in the control of psychic phenomena and fields of knowledge have been opened up before him of which he had previously been more or less unaware but all this would not only be unavailing but harmful if spiritualism were not ethically and spiritually right as well as phenomenally true it is no good developing something which leads one ultimately only into a mire of harmful results and a false philosophy if spiritualism cannot be justified from the religious and ethical standpoint it should be let entirely alone by all save the few scrupulously scientific investigators who approach the subject from that point of view and not as a belief it is very important therefore for the spiritualist to have his belief founded in correct ethical principles for as i have before pointed out the reproach has been raised against spiritualists that they are everything but spiritual unfortunately there are many of this type but they are doubtless in the minority and the majority of spiritualists wish to see their faiths grounded on firm ethical principles is it right to investigate psychic phenomena various questions arise in this connection the objection to spiritualism may first of all be raised that such things are god's secrets which he keeps to himself what is the use of seeking you will find nothing but to this monsignor camille flammarion replies rightly there always have been people who liked ignorance better than knowledge by this kind of reasoning had man acted upon it nothing would ever have been known of this world it is the mode of reasoning adopted by those who do not care to think for themselves and who confide to directors so-called the charge of controlling their consciences if these phenomena really exist they must be part of the universe and subject to natural law for otherwise they could not exist at all there is no such thing as the supernatural all is natural even if it be the communication of spirits it may be unusual or uncommon 
And because of this, we call these phenomena supernormal. That is beyond the ordinary normal experience of mankind, but they are not and cannot be supernatural. Concerning fraud and error. Again, the objection may be raised that these phenomena foster superstition, that this is based upon the belief that the phenomena are necessarily untrue. Once the reality of the facts is established, there is no superstition connected with it. It becomes merely a question of scientific evidence. Again, the objection has been raised against spiritualism on the ground that it encourages fraud and charlatanism. To some extent, this is true, but other cults have suffered in the same way, and all sincere spiritualists are the first to expose falsity and fraud when they meet it. There are spiritualists, it is true, who endeavor to shelter fraudulent mediums and pretend that this fraud does not exist. Such a method is a great mistake and only tends to degrade and lower spiritualism as a religious belief in the eyes of the public. Truth is mighty and shall prevail, and truth should above all else be the watchword of the true spiritualist. Is it healthy and normal? Then there is the objection that spiritualistic practices encourage morbid and abnormal states and conditions and help to induce insanity. Again, there is some excuse for this argument, but as so often pointed out, it is the conscious or unconscious abuse of psychic and mediumistic power rather than its use, which is so dangerous and detrimental. In the initial experimental stages of spiritualism, some harm has doubtless resulted to some experimenters, but this is only a stronger reason for urging us to discover and rightly understand the laws and conditions under which psychic phenomena and spirit communication may operate. When these are once understood, they are thereby rendered safe, and thenceforward there is no reason why spiritualistic practices should be unsafe, save for those who neglect its well-ascertained laws. Again, it has been urged that it is wrong to communicate with spirits of the departed for the reason that such communication is not natural and that by doing so we interfere with the progression and spiritual development of those who have passed over. But the reply to this is twofold. In the first place, the many cases of spirit return which are recorded prove that these phenomena are far more common than is usually supposed, and for this reason it is not so exceptional a thing, but almost a common occurrence. It partakes more of the nature of natural law than of the experimental or miraculous event. If such is the case, it can hardly be detrimental or unnatural, since none of nature's laws are unnatural. Does spirit communication retard progression? Again, there is no reason to suppose that communication retards the spiritual progress of those who have died. On the contrary, we might suppose that in many cases, at least, such communication would certainly help the spirits. And in many cases, as we know, they have repeatedly come back for the express purpose of asking the living to carry out some mission for them which weighed upon their minds. And they have stated that they could get no rest or comfort until this mission has been fulfilled. There are many cases, again, as we know, 
wherein the returning spirits have requested help and the prayers of the living to assist them in their progress, and many spiritualists have devoted their lives to this work, namely assisting earthbound spirits and helping them in their natural spiritual progress. Many spirits have returned to impart certain information or to give counsel, warning, or advice to friends and relatives of theirs still living. And we cannot but believe that they are far happier in doing so than if they were obliged to stand by and see some unhappiness, accident, or catastrophe overtake their loved ones on earth, while they themselves were obliged to remain inactive. Were they still alive, they would like to feel that they had prevented such a catastrophe, and it is only natural to suppose that they continue to live in this way and continue to take an interest in their loved ones after they have passed over. In this way, spiritual communication becomes a natural and beautiful belief. Should the dead know our sorrows? This brings us to another important question from the ethical point of view, and this is that the so-called dead are in constant sympathetic communication with those still living, and that they, after they have died, have a knowledge of our lives, our trials, and our tribulations. Many religious persons contend that this is a very unethical belief, and that they should know nothing of those on this earth after once they have died. Yet, this is surely contrary to all human sympathy and experience. A mother wrapped up in the interests of her child would surely prefer to remain near it and watch over, guard and guide it, if possible, for a few years, rather than to desert it wholly and be totally ignorant of its life and progress. Yet, this is what Orthodox religion contends they should do. Spiritualism is far more ethical in this respect than the ordinary religious teachings, since it tells us that constant sympathetic rapport exists between this world and the next and that there is no abrupt severing of the ties of human sympathy and love at the moment of death. This surely is a comforting thought for the bereaved. The Ethical Teachings of Spiritualism The religious teachings of spiritualism are otherwise far more ethical than those of any other religion. Instead of a world devoted to selfish personal progression, subject to the changeable whims of an external deity. We have in the teachings of spiritualism a perfectly consistent and scientifically founded religious faith, quite in accordance with the doctrine of evolution. All progress depends upon personal development. As Dr. Alfred Russell Wallace says in his Miracles, of modern spiritualism. The hypothesis of spiritualism not only accounts for all the facts and is the only one that does so, but it is further remarkable as being associated with a theory of a future state of existence, which is the only one yet given to the world that can at all commend itself to the modern philosophical mind. The main doctrines of this religion are that after death, man's spirit survives in an ethereal body, gifted with new powers, but mentally and morally the same individual as when clothed in flesh. That he commences from that moment a course of apparently endless progression which is rapid just in proportion as his mental and moral faculties were active while on earth. That his comparative happiness or misery will depend entirely on himself and that just in proportion as his higher human faculties 
have taken part in all his pleasures here, will he find himself contented and happy in a state of existence in which they will have the same exercise, while he who has depended more on the body than on the mind for his pleasures will, when that body is no more, feel a grievous want and must slowly and painfully develop his intellectual and moral nature till its exercise shall become easy and pleasurable. Neither punishments nor rewards are meted out by an external power, but each one's condition is the natural and inevitable sequence of his condition here. He starts again from the level of moral and intellectual development to which he has raised himself while on earth. Should mediums accept money? One other point remains to be considered. It is this, that mediums accept money for their services, and inasmuch as this is a spiritual gift, it is wrong. Yet, this is common to all other religions. Do not ministers of all other religions receive compensation in some form or other for their services? As long as mediums are living in this material world, they are obliged to meet the costs of living like all other human beings, no matter how spiritual their work or they themselves may be. If mediums possess genuine power, it is only natural, in a sense, that they should utilize it and turn it to account, and it is certainly true that by doing so, they help their fellow men and help those who come to them as much or more than men in any other walk in life. This being so, it can hardly be said that any aspect of spiritualism is in itself unethical. It is, on the contrary, the most sensible, rational, and ethical religion in the world. End of chapter 34. Recorded by Cynthia Sheeler. Website, CynthiaSheeler.iCanVoice.com. Chapter 35 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harrowood Carrington. Chapter 35 What Happens After Death. Precisely what happens at the moment of death is one of the most dramatically interesting and one of the most striking insoluble problems in the world today. It remains for us the problem of all problems, the mystery of the universe, the science of being. One moment we see a figure before us, a muscular, powerful man, capable of heroic efforts, great intellectual flights, lofty aspirations, delivering an oration which stirs the hearts of thousands, and perhaps helps to sway the destiny of nations, and change the map of the world. The next moment he is lying on the floor, a corpse, lifeless, inanimate, incapable of the slightest thought, the slightest muscular exertion. He is the victim of heart failure. The Mystery of Death a second and all has changed nothing can now be influenced by him nothing is now possible but the gradual decomposition of the body and its return to the dust from whence it sprang could any change be more profound or more lasting since it can occur presumably but once in all eternity the slightest anatomical variation in the man's body so small perhaps that even a microscope cannot detect it and we then behold the most mighty change which occurs in nature the profoundest of tragedies and wonders we behold the transition from the living to the lifeless we pass from life to death what is this change we have seen before us can we in any way understand it what can we learn what see 
these are questions over which men have pondered for centuries and which still form the most fascinating problem in the realm of spiritual inquiry why we should not fear death many persons fear death but they should not do so for the reason that on any theory it is not a thing to be feared it has been proved abundantly that with the exception of very rare cases there is no pain at the moment of death and no consciousness of dying both are obliterated by the kind hand of nature the suffering which goes before belongs rather to life than to death and in fact many of those who have suffered from some torturing disease have died with a smile of happiness and contentment on their faces of the physical body we need think little since the spiritual body separates itself from this body after death and thenceforward is as unconscious of it as we are of a finger or any part of our body which has been cut off during life the human spirit takes some time to become severed completely from the physical body and for this reason it should not be buried or cremated too soon after death but with these exceptions we need think little of the state of the physical body since we sever our connections with it entirely as soon as we pass into the spirit world what happens after we have effected this separation is naturally a question of absorbing interest to many minds since all of us have to look forward to this experience the statements of clairvoyance and of those spirits who have returned to tell us of their passage into the next life should therefore be of considerable interest in this connection let us see what they have to say a clairvoyant description of death andrew jackson davis one of the founders of modern spiritualism and a gifted seer describes the process as follows suppose the person is now dying it is to be a rapid death the feet first grow cold the clairvoyant sees right over the head what may be called a magnetic halo an etheric emanation in appearance golden and throbbing as though conscious the body is now cold up to the knees and elbows and the emanation has ascended higher in the air the legs are cold to the hips and the arms to the shoulders and the emanation though it has not risen higher in the room is more expanded the death coldness steals over the breast and around on one side and the emanation has attained a higher position nearer the ceiling the person has ceased to breathe the pulse is feeble and the emanation is elongated and fashioned in the outline of the human form beneath it is connected with the brain the head of the person is internally throbbing a slow deep throb not painful but like the beat of the sea hence the thinking faculties are rational while nearly every part of the person is dead owing to the brain's momentum i have seen a dying person even at the last feeble pulse beat rise impulsively in bed to converse with a friend but the next instant he was gone his brain being the last to yield up the life principle formation of the spiritual body the golden emanation which extends up midway to the ceiling is connected with the brain by a very fine life thread now the body of the emanation ascends then appears something white and shining like a human head next in a very few moments a faint outline of the face divine then the fair neck and shoulders then in rapid succession come all parts of the new body down to the feet a bright shining image a little smaller than its physical body but a perfect prototype or reproduction in all except its disfigurements the fine life thread continues attached to the old brain the next thing is the withdrawal of the electric principle when this thread snaps the spiritual body is free and prepared to accompany its guardians to the summer land yes there is a spiritual body it is sown in dishonor and raised in brightness how it feels to pass over here again what a returning spirit says who has passed through the valley of the shadow of death and has apparently returned to tell us his experiences 
when i awoke in the spirit life and perceived that i had hands and feet and all that belongs to the human body i cannot express to you in the form of words the feelings which at that moment seemed to take possession of my soul i realized that i had this body a spiritual body imagine if you can what the surprise of a spirit must be to find after the struggle of death that he is a new-born spirit free from the decaying tabernacle of flesh that he leaves behind him i gazed on weeping friends with a saddened heart mingled with joy knowing as i did that i could be with them and behold them daily though unseen and unknown and as i gazed upon the lifeless tenement of clay and could behold the beauty of its mechanism i felt impelled to seek the author of so much beauty and youth and prostrate myself at his feet i felt a light touch on my shoulder and joy unspeakable i beheld the loved ones of earth some of whom had long since departed from the earth plane and i felt myself ascending or rather floating onward and upward through the radiance of space i saw about me many spirits and their guides bearing them company through the bright realms of immensity novel experiences on the other side so the human spirit issuing from the body gradually rises higher and higher and comes into touch and harmony with those about it and with those who possess sympathy and mutual interest as explained in the chapter devoted to the spirit world it is highly improbable that there are any physical barriers between the spheres one from another but they are doubtless separated nevertheless by walls of mental and spiritual origin if we are in one of these planes we must progress upward before we can reach or remain with those whom we desire most and for this reason there is a hell so to say for those who cannot attain what they desire which can only be by continual striving upward and onward in this however they are constantly helped and assisted by spirit guides and helpers so that progress is rapid when it is really desired and worked for how we turn back to communicate on the lower planes of existence communication with those of the earth is it is said comparatively easy but this becomes increasingly difficult as we ascend in the upward scale it has often been pointed out that descending to communicate with those on earth is something like going down to the bottom of a muddy pool and those who desire to go to the bottom of muddy pools are very rare even on this earth still spirits moved by ties of love for those left behind make the attempt from time to time successful or unsuccessful in proportion to favorable or unfavorable conditions this however we discussed in former chapters as we progress we are said to acquire more interest in the new world and lose interest in this just as we gradually lose interest in one country when we move into another new scenes new interests and the new environment gradually alter our line of thought but just as we are always glad to see a relative or an old friend from the home town or the motherland so are we most happy to meet and greet those who pass over when their turn comes to join us in the spirit world how we progress in the spirit world after these initial stages have passed upward progress and development begin for many however the shock of death has a very severe effect especially in cases of suicide and those who have met with sudden and violent deaths in such cases these spirits require some time to recover their normal selves and have to be nursed back to health as it were on the other side the same is true of those spirits who have had their minds affected by some mental or physical disease but after this stage has been passed they all emerge into the brightness beyond and begin their interest their instruction their learning and their progress of soul and spirit as well as of intellect which is to occupy them for ages of time to come those who die are received and cared for by loving friends on the other side just as they were when they were born into this world one need have no hesitation nor fear on this account physical birth is a terrible experience but we remember nothing of it and there are always those present who will tender and care for us 
in the same way birth into the spirit world through the gates of death is in many ways a terrible shock yet we are cared for by loving guardians and received with love and care finding happiness awaiting us when we pass from this world into the world beyond end of chapter thirty five what happens after death recording by pamela krantz chapter thirty six of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by chuck williamson your psychic powers and how to develop them by Harroward Carrington Chapter thirty six Bad and Perverted Uses of Spiritualism Every gift or power can be abused. Many in the past have turned their increased psychic powers into evil channels at various times in the world's history, and who continue to do so today. They are known as magicians witches vampires possessors of the evil eye etc etc for the moment it may be pointed out that psychic unfoldment and increase of psychic power brings with it added responsibility as our power in this direction is increased so also we are expected to use it rightly if much has been given us much is expected it is quite possible it is true for these powers to be turned to bad account and others injured wealth acquired etc temporarily by their use but if these powers are used for these purposes they are usually soon lost and then the student is in a far worse condition than before for the reason that he is not only without the added power which he craves but also has deteriorated mentally morally and physically as the result of their harmful use the difference between magic and mediumship in the middle ages psychic powers were undoubtedly used for good and bad purposes white magic was beneficial and black magic harmful white magic invoked angels black magic invoked devils in neither case were the spirits of departed human beings called upon but rather intelligences either lower or higher than man in the human scale of evolution another thing which distinguishes mediumship from magic is that mediumship is more in the nature of a request a calling upon human intelligences for help and advice magic on the other hand depends upon invocation or demanding the presence and assistance of other intelligences differing from the human and their assistance in the work to be performed how invocations are performed for the purposes of this invocation various magical practices were undertaken such as prayer the saying of certain words and sentences preparation of the magic circle with its pentagram seal of solomon etc as well as utilizing various magical preparations secured from dead bodies and the poisons of animals and reptiles etc these magical practices were usually undertaken at certain seasons and phases of the moon after long training on the part of the magician and in specially prepared rooms or localities which had been kept apart only for magical purposes exact descriptions of such invocations and the methods employed are to be found in certain rare books on the ritual of magic 
but inasmuch as they are neither healthy nor desirable we do not deem it wise or right to place these teachings before the student who might be tempted did he possess the knowledge to put them into operation and thus injure himself mentally and morally perhaps beyond repair students who are interested may consult a e wait the book of black magic and of pax levi the doctrine and ritual of transcendental magic etc an explanation of witchcraft during the middle ages also witchcraft flourished it depended upon the use of certain psychic powers which witches were said to possess only in their cases this power came directly from the devil himself being bestowed upon them in person by his satanic majesty the witches were all said to meet two or three times a year on some lonely mountain top at midnight these meetings being called sabbaths at these sabbaths all sorts of magical and anti-religious ceremonies were held the sacrament was mocked the devil was worshipped etc the witch was said to swear allegiance to the devil who thereupon touched her on some part of the body which became anaesthetic lacking all sensation these marks occurred in various parts of the body and such marks were consequently known as witch marks the probable explanation of such cases is that in connection with the abnormal mental and physical states induced by witches there resulted in a peculiar form of hysteria in which small zones or patches on the body became anaesthetic modern science now recognizes the existence of such insensible patches and calls them anaesthetic zones they are typical of this form of hysteria this is the modern scientific explanation of the so-called witch marks the journeys to the sabbaths were doubtless for the most part imaginary flights resulting from the administration of opiates and other drugs which they were known to take and with which they anointed their bodies at the same time it is probable that there were many genuine supernormal psychical phenomena connected with witchcraft and this is becoming more and more probable as we progress in the understanding of such cases devil worship another form of perverted occultism is that of devil worship which exists in various forms even today in paris the malay peninsula in london in new york and doubtless in other large cities at these meetings which are devoted to devil worship various invocations etc are gone through and the devil is said to appear in person and bestow power upon certain privileged members of the club who are thereafter enabled to use certain powers to their own advantage many of the scenes of these devil-worshipping societies are too revolting to be described but have been pictured at length on one or two occasions by those who have taken part in these invocations the evil eye again certain individuals have a power which is known as the evil eye this is particularly believed in by the peasants of naples and southern italy by the peasantry of southern spain austria and other countries anyone possessing the evil eye is supposed to have the power of bewitching or maiming any person or animal upon whom he throws his glance cattle looked at by one possessing the evil eye invariably become sick and die 
crops fail pestilence falls etc the evil eye is a gift which is usually unsought but comes spontaneously and is not desired by anyone the sure way to guard against the evil eye according to the beliefs of the countries mentioned is to extend the first and fourth fingers of the hand toward the possessors of the evil eye the second and third fingers being folded over into the palm of the hand and kept there by the thumb in this position the outer fingers somewhat resemble the horns of a bull and if the hand holding the fingers in this position be pointed at any of the children or beggars in the above-named countries they will usually turn and fly from the sign-maker many europeans use this knowledge to rid themselves of uh, pestilent beggars vampires and how they attack another form of evil influence which is said to exist and is particularly believed in by the natives of silesia moravia and southern carpathia is that covered by the general word vampire in our ordinary language a vampire is a species of bat and the word is employed because human vampires were said to assume the shape of large bats at times flying in the windows when their victims are asleep a vampire is one who sucks the lifeblood of his victims through two small holes punctured in the skin in very much the same way that a mosquito sucks our blood after puncturing the epidermis these holes are said to occur usually in the throat and the victim is of course attacked as a rule during sleep those who are vampires after they are dead and buried are enabled in some miraculous way it is said to leave their coffins and tombs and wander about seeking victims when they are dug up they are found fresh with a pink complexion and the whole body engorged with blood the only sure way to kill vampires it is said is to drive a stake through the heart or cut off the head when a quantity of fresh blood will gush forth and the vampire is killed forever tradition also says that those who are bitten by vampires become vampires in turn modern vampirage vampires of a certain sort however are not unknown in our own day in an interesting article on vampires in the occult review june 1908 dr franz hartmann described a method of what might be termed natural vampirage he refers to the bible first kings one and also alludes to certain processes by which one person is enabled to draw vital energy from another by establishing close contact this process of nature is governed by well-fixed laws through ignorance of these laws many people have become victims of modern vampirage another form of perverted occultism which remains is the employment of charms amulets talismans etc which are often sold for the purpose of inducing mental and physical disease and black magic which has existed through all ages we must not forget also the so-called voodoo practices of the natives of west africa which are said to be remarkable by those who have witnessed them how to protect yourself from occult and evil influences it is often a little difficult for the modern student of the occult to determine just how much he is to believe in these stories 
undoubtedly most of them are based on superstition fanaticism and imagination at the same time there is enough truth in them to make us be cautious and put us on our guard never under any circumstances should you undertake to practice any of them for low selfish purposes in order to protect yourself from influences of this sort if you feel that they are being wielded against you resort to the measures outlined in previous chapters and you may be sure that if you do this you will be impervious to all ordinary influences of this kind end of chapter thirty six Chapter 37 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Caraz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hereward Carrington. Chapter 37 Snares and Pitfalls to Avoid. The cautious student of psychics who desires to progress along the right lines scientifically and mathematically must be on his guard against all possible sources of delusion and error which may creep into his development, so he may never mistake the false for the true or spurious phenomena for the genuine. A few sources of error and some of the mistakes which the psychic student is apt to make will be pointed out in this chapter, together with the means and methods of guarding against them. First of all, do not be too credulous of the phenomena you receive and accept. If you have a chill or a nervous twitch, do not assume that this is some message or a touch from a spirit hand. It may be so, but you must receive good proof of the fact before accepting it. Should you be too credulous and accept all such incidents as genuine phenomena, you will soon be led away so far that you will become unbalanced in your point of view. The Over-Negative Condition in your development do not be too negative hold the mind always centered and conscious as i have said and keep the center of yourself always active it is only safe to abandon this in very advanced studies do not be too negative in your daily life or accept the advice which spirits or mediums give you to the exclusion of all else you should reason in such matters thus an intelligence has offered me certain advice if that person were yet alive and offered me the same advice would i take it you should accept the advice of spirits as you would that of human beings who are merely spirits still in the flesh. In other words, as so often pointed out before in previous chapters, use your own judgment and discrimination on all messages received. If the messages are of an erratic nature, such as those which ask you to give up your position, go on a long journey, etc., you should be most cautious and only accept such advice after you have fully proved to your own satisfaction that it is wise and beneficial abuse of the sixth sense do not depend upon your sixth sense until you have exhausted the senses you already possess if you refuse to let these work you can hardly suppose that help and assistance will come from outside no seed will not grow in a soil that is not prepared neither will spiritual help be planted in your mental soil if you have not worked to prepare it for the spiritual influx as a rule our own individual spirit is the best guide we must consult this first after that, if you seek additional advice and help, this may often be obtained from wise and experienced psychics, but I cannot too strongly warn the student against accepting the advice of poorly developed mediums, either professional or amateur. On changing mediums and circles, it is not a good thing to change developing mediums if this can be avoided. If you have found one medium who can assist you to develop and who is apparently doing so helpfully and rightly, stick to him through thick and thin until his advice or help fails you the mixture of magnetism which is introduced with change of developing mediums may be at times very harmful the same thing may be said of circles once a circle of sitters is formed the same group should sit night after night and it is not at all a good practice to allow strangers constantly to intrude into the circle and take the places of others if changes must be made, let one at a time assume the place of the absent sitter, and let him sit thoroughly familiar with the surroundings and conditions before a second change is made. You would be wise to mistrust names of important historical persons if they appear in your own speech or writing, 
or if they are obtained at seances. Our natural vanity may lead us to hope and expect that such personages may be present, but there is evidence that in many cases lying spirits have taken the place of those whose names they gave. In this connection, it may be said that the historical personages are not, as a rule, most desirable. The best help and the greatest teachings have been obtained from simple people who are now on the other side. Sensitivity and Mediumship Do not try from the first to develop as a medium. Try rather to cultivate your own psychic powers and strengthen your own inner nature. After you have developed psychically and spiritually in this way, you'll be far better enabled to receive and transmit genuine mediumistic messages. Better enabled also to interpret them. Better able to withstand the strain of mediumship and run far less danger of obsession and other unpleasant symptoms which badly developed mediums are likely to encounter. Cultivate your psychic self, therefore, and after this has been truly trained, begin to train your mediumistic powers. Be on the lookout for evil and lying spirits who will constantly deceive you if you are not prepared for them and remain too open and receptive. Study your own phenomena and endeavor to disengage genuine psychic and mediumistic manifestations from those due to your own subconscious mind. This is an excellent and very helpful practice which will prove useful to you as you progress. Do not assume that all figures which you see are spirits. They may be thought forms, doubles, etheric bodies, or imaginary creations of your own. Things a psychic should avoid. You can only learn to disentangle this wonderful chain and separate the true from the false after months and perhaps years of study, observation, and experiment. Above all, remember that symbolic figures and representations must be interpreted symbolically and should never be accepted as representing the truth as it actually exists. One of the great dangers to the amateur medium, as before explained, is that of extending his symbolic, intuitive impressions beyond the proper point. If he stated only what was given him, he would usually be right, but if he endeavors to interpret them himself, find their explanations, etc., he very often goes wrong. Do not hang on too long, so to say, to the impressions and images you perceive. Let them float before you in space, seeing and analyzing them as they pass. Do not endeavor to hold them to you by the power of your mind. If you do so, they will not only vanish and disappear, but you will be unable to retain the impression you receive, and quite possibly the power of perceiving these images which you now possess will become less and less and gradually leave you. Always remember that psychic phenomena of this character cannot be commanded. They can only be sought and welcomed when they appear. In other words, they are spontaneous and not experimental phenomena. How to distinguish the true from the false. If you constantly make use of your own judgment and critical faculty in studying the phenomena which you develop or those which you may observe in others, you will build up within yourself two things. One of these is the power of judging, that is the ability to perceive the true from the false, and which above all else is what you as a psychic desire. It is difficult to explain the difference in words, but as nearly as possible it may be said that these phenomena which are innately true carry with them a sense of conviction, a feeling of warmth and familiarity, and we feel them as part of ourselves. The other phenomena, although occurring in our own minds, will seem to us cold, strange, and extraneous, and when once this power to distinguish between the two types of phenomena has been developed, you have taken one of the most important forward steps that is possible for any psychic to take. Many mediums, indeed, never reach this state. Their mediumship is chaotic. It has never been developed on rational, progressive lines. But if you have done so, you may rest assured that you are not only a genuine and true medium, but you have passed through the early stages and danger zones which so often beset the student in the early stages of development. How to Guard Against Outside Influence The second important step which the student takes after he has once passed this stage is that while he will be sensitive and receptive to telepathic clairvoyant and other forms of perception, and also to spirits both in and out of the body, he will be practically impervious to harmful or malicious thoughts and influences which may be impelled against him not only on this sphere, but by the spirit world as well. If a trance clairvoyant during a state of ecstasy leaves his body and wanders off into space without having previously gained sufficient knowledge and hence control of the situation, he is liable to be blown hither and thither 
figuratively speaking, like a soap bubble by the breezes, and will be open to impressions from all sources. These he may not feel or know at the time, but he may carry these back with him into his body, and afterwards they may affect him to the detriment of his own mental and spiritual health. In other words, he has not learned to protect himself while severed from the body as he can while in it. This is one of the greatest dangers which the advanced psychic is liable to encounter, and at the same time, after he has once learned the secret of protecting himself in this manner, he may be assured that thenceforward his progress will be most marked and rapid, not only in psychic and mediumistic development, but in the spirit world after he has entered it permanently at death. The Value of Psychic Development to the Individual Psychic development is, therefore, of inestimable worth, if rightly cultivated for the rapid progression of the individual human spirit, just as much as the same power badly employed is harmful to the human spirit, both here and hereafter. It all depends on the manner in which these forces and powers have been cultivated and are utilized. And while too much cannot be said against their improper use, a great deal may be said in favor of their proper application and development in the right direction. It is my hope that every reader of this book will develop himself along the right lines, and that he may receive help, advice, and encouragement at all stages of his spiritual unfoldment, both here and hereafter. End of chapter 37 Recording by Alex Caraz, New York Chapter 38 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Caraz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harold Ward Carrington. Chapter 38 Physical Phenomena. The physical phenomena of spiritualism, as distinct from the mental or psychical phenomena, are those which relate to the physical world and in which some mechanical or physical movement of matter takes place. In clairvoyance, for example, no such physical phenomena occur, so far as we can see, but if a table be lifted into the air by supernormal means, we here come into contact with mechanical and physical forces, and with these we have to reckon. Phenomena with Physical Contact We must begin at the beginning in treating of physical phenomena and go back, first of all, to those which involve some form of contact. Doubtless you have seen performances of so-called mind-readers who found lost articles which were hidden in various parts of the room or hall, when one who knew their hiding place held the psychic's hand or placed it to his forehead, etc. In most of these performances it is not mind-reading at all, strictly speaking, which we see, but what is technically known as muscle-reading, that is, the faint unconscious twitchings of the muscles of the person holding the psychic's hand are felt and interpreted by him, consciously or unconsciously, and these guide him to the spot where the article is hidden. Incredible as it may appear, this is the correct explanation of these cases, and you may easily test it for yourself by asking a group of your friends to hide some object while you are out of the room, and then, when you enter, to give you one of their hands. If now you concentrate on the faint pullings and pushings which they will give you, you will be enabled to find the article in nine cases out of ten. Of course, this, like everything else, improves with practice, and you must not expect to be an expert on the first trial. Some performers who have had years of experience grow so proficient in this, however, that they are enabled to open safes whose combinations they do not know, while merely holding the hand of one who does or even drive a cab along the streets of a crowded city while blindfolded and holding the hand of one who can see the vehicles on the street. The Development of Independent Force and Power The next step is in planchette writing, where the hand, as before explained, moves at first as the result of unconscious muscular action. After a time, however, some psychic force seems to be developed and the board often continues to move about even after the hands of the operator are removed from it. Beyond this again, we have those cases of so-called dousing, where the forked hazel twig bends to and fro in the hands of the water finder when he walks over water and metals. The simple movements which are felt at first are probably due to muscular twitchings, but as the force develops, it seems to become more independent and the twig is bent in spite of the efforts to hold it. 
Table Tipping and Levitations The next class of physical phenomena are those with the table. A group sits around an ordinary table and can tilt and tip it, as many have doubtless seen. The first simple movements here, as formerly, are probably due to the unconscious muscular pressure of those having their hands on the table. But later on, as the psychic force develops and charges the table, it seems to assume an independent character and the table often continues to move when all hands are withdrawn from it. In fact, as an expert psychic student has pointed out, in many instances, and especially under unfavorable conditions, the phenomena do not rise above the initial stage of simple, non-intelligent movements, leaving the impression on the minds of the investigators that the force exhibited is, if at present unknown and unaccounted for, nevertheless a natural and mechanical one and that the action of independent intelligence in connection with it cannot be conceived. This has been the experience and has been the verdict of even scientific inquirers who have not hesitated to give that verdict to the world. How the power increases. Such a conclusion is based upon inaccurate knowledge and upon imperfect and superficial observation. All experienced psychic students are aware that it is often only after repeated and prolonged sittings that the full development of the psychic force is obtained and that independent intelligence is exhibited in connection with it and that in by far the larger number of instances that stage of the experiment is never reached at all. That it is, however, the ultimate issue of the experiment is now admitted by all patient and painstaking students who have devoted sufficient time to the observation of the phenomena and have carried on their investigations with an open mind and in a systematic manner. As will be seen later on, it is fully admitted that the mysterious force, thus called into operation in some unknown way, issues from the physical organism of the sensitive and the sitters, and is in itself an unintelligent force. But it is with equal confidence asserted that when it is available in sufficient quantity and is wholly detached from the physical organism, it can be and beyond all doubt is frequently manipulated by intelligences independent of and other than that of the psychic and the investigators assisting in the experiment how physical phenomena are produced the principle upon which many physical phenomena are based then is simply this there is a vital or a nervous force existing in many of us as described in an earlier chapter which is usually limited to the surface of our own bodies so that unless we touch the object in question, we cannot move it. Under certain conditions, however, this vital energy or fluid is capable of being projected outward beyond the normal bodily limits into space, and when powerful enough, is capable of moving physical objects with which it comes into contact. Or, if it be a rapid outward projection of this force, it produces percussive sounds or raps well known to spiritualists. This psychic force is often uncontrolled and then objects are moved without the knowledge of and even against the wish of the medium. We then have the so-called spontaneous poltergeist phenomena, etc. At other times, this force may be guided and manipulated by the conscious or unconscious mind of the medium. Beyond this stage, again, is one in which the medium is unconscious of what is occurring, having passed into trance, etc., and it is then that many of the most striking physical phenomena occur. At such times, complicated and intelligent physical manifestations are produced which are not due either to the mind of the medium or to any person present. Externalized Vital Energy We here enter the realm of genuine physical phenomena produced by spirit intelligences. Most of the communications are obtained through raps following a code. Playing upon musical instruments, etc., are due to this source. In other words, after a certain point has been reached, the externalized vital energy or psychic power of the medium is manipulated by an external intelligence, and they can even create forms or phantoms by utilizing it, as will be explained in the chapter devoted to materialization. Controlling the Phenomena Very interesting experiments have been conducted in the past in controlling these physical phenomena, but not much success has been attained in this direction. There is here a wide field for experiment which the thoughtful student might enter. Thus, on one occasion, a medium who has had the power of producing raps was hypnotized 
and it was suggested that raps should be produced at will according to the suggestion of the hypnotist. This was completely successful. It was also suggested that raps be obtained in any article of furniture which the hypnotist would suggest. This also succeeded. The range and variety of physical phenomena are very great, including manifestations such as raps, table levitations, movement of objects without contact, playing upon musical instruments without apparent cause, spirit and thought photography, materialization, slate writing, trumpet phenomena, etc. The Effect of Light All physical phenomena seem to be hindered very largely by light, either daylight or artificial light, and they can very rarely be produced except in darkness. Should you attempt to obtain phenomena of this character, therefore, it would be well for you to sit in the darkness, especially at first, and then request that more and more light be permitted as your power increases and the phenomena appear. Most mediums begin their development by seating themselves in a cabinet in a darkened room, and often it is necessary to sit in this way for every evening for several weeks or even months before any phenomena appear. If you are naturally psychic, however, and physical phenomena are going to be manifested through your mediumship, you would doubtless only have to sit for a fraction of this time in order for the first manifestations to make themselves felt. And probably afterwards, you would be so interested in the process that you would not count the time you spent in your development. First Symptoms and Phenomena It is probable that the first indications of phenomena of this character you will receive are tiny spots of light which form before you in space, and either suddenly appear or remain stationary for some time and then join themselves together forming one larger light. As time progresses you will see that this light cloudy mass will become more and more definite in outline and shape, and will probably begin to assume the shape of a phantom or form standing before you. When this stage has been reached you should concentrate your receptive faculties and endeavor to get on rapport with this form, for such it now is and after a time you will be doubtless be able to establish more or less intelligent mental communication and exchange messages. This will usually appear before physical phenomena become manifest, though in certain cases it may be later on. Dr. Baraduc of Paris succeeded on several occasions in photographing those groups of light or masses of matter which thus floated before him, and the student who has once succeeded in receiving manifestations of a like nature might well conduct similar experiments if he be sufficiently alert and able to do so. If not, a friend who is with him and has attended his process of development might endeavor to take these photographs at the moment when the psychic states they are vividly present before him. There are thus two ways of cultivating physical mediumship. One is to sit in the dark, the other is to experiment more or less consciously in light or semi-darkness, and when a certain amount of power has been gained in this direction, to endeavor to transfer or carry this over into the dark seance and to transmit this power to a spirit who will thenceforth utilize it and by its aid produce physical phenomena. Developing in the Dark If you sit for physical development in the dark, you are never sure what kind of phenomena you are to obtain. In a seance this is beneficial, since you should never aim to get one type of phenomenon. As before explained, for if you do, you shut out by your attitude all other phenomena which might spontaneously develop. At the same time, it is always satisfactory for the beginner to be able to control his phenomena a little, especially at first, and for this reason the second method of experimentation is advisable, and if desired might be carried out at the same time as the other method of development, so that the two progress side by side. If you sit in the dark, you should by all means provide yourself with a cabinet since this will tend to concentrate the force and much less energy will have to be expended by you for the production of any phenomena you may obtain. Also, you should abstain from using your will or thinking consciously of practical everyday affairs. Make the mind a blank, holding only the thought of self and await results. How to develop in the light In developing your power for the production of physical phenomena along the other lines mentioned, it is best to begin with the simple experiments and gradually work up to the more complicated ones. For example, begin with a planchette or Ouija board, placing the tips of the fingers on the board, and after it has begun to move rapidly to and fro or round and round, very gradually withdraw the hand 
and see whether or not the board continues to move about. Again, when the table has begun to tip and rise into the air, two or three legs, as a result of placing your hands upon it, gradually withdraw your fingers and see whether the table remains suspended, or when it is at its highest point and you feel that it is thoroughly charged with your fluid, drop the whole force of your being into your will and see if you cannot levitate the table completely from the floor. Again, if wraps are coming on the table upon which your hands rest, see if these cannot be obtained when your hands are removed a fraction of an inch from its surface. And if they are, endeavor to produce wraps by making a motion towards the table as though hitting it, stopping short a quarter or half an inch above its surface. If you are successful, a rap or a sound in the tabletop will come following this movement. Instruments for testing your power. A number of simple devices have been constructed with the object of testing mediumship in its early stages, and one or two of these you can make at home, and this would prove very helpful to you. Thus, you might suspend a small pitch or cork ball by means of a silk thread five or six inches long from a hook. If now you place the fingers of one hand almost touching this ball and leave it there for some moments, you may, if successful, succeed in causing this ball to move either towards or away from your fingers as you will. This is a very useful little experiment which may be tried on many occasions and will be found very beneficial in developing simple physical phenomena. Another device which may be employed is the following. Procure a straw, such as used at the soda fountains, and pass a needle through it directly in the center. Press the lower end of the needle into a large flat cork. See that the straw revolves easily upon the slightest pressure. Place your fingers nearly touching one end of the straw and will that it shall move either to the right or to the left. This instrument has proved very successful in many cases and will probably prove more sensitive than the last. There are more complicated scientific instruments which have been devised to test the externalization of the human fluid and the power of the will. These instruments have been used with great benefit by many scientific students. How to begin. When the student has progressed thus far, he is ready to try his first experiment in the movement of physical objects lying on his table. Begin with a very small, light object such as a cork. Do not choose any metal object. Place the fingertips of both hands on either side of the object nearly touching it. Wait until you feel distinct tingling sensations in the fingers and if this sensation extends to the elbows or even to the shoulders, so much the better. Endeavor to construct by your will and imagination, so to speak, a fine thread or hair composed of psychic rays passing between your fingers and supporting the object in question. Concentrate on this for some moments before you make any physical movement. Then, very slowly raise the fingers and see whether the cork is influenced to follow the upper directions of your fingers. If so, you have begun your course of physical mediumship. As this initial experiment is very important, it would be well to dwell upon it at somewhat greater length, since nothing is so discouraging to the beginner as innumerable tests and experiments of this kind which fail one after the other. Of course, perfectly non-mediumistic persons will con continue to fail, but your natural psychics will not. How to Obtain the First Phenomena we have seen in an earlier chapter that the aura extends from the body and particularly the fingertips and that the human fluid is capable of projection at will. Now it is this fluid which is the basis or substance out of which the psychic threads or rays are spun and these threads when they have stretched from fingers to finger and gain sufficient solidity are capable of lifting quite heavy objects. Dr. Achorovitz who has studied these rays for years calls them rigid rays and asserts that his medium, Mademoiselle Tomchik, can by an effort of will construct a psychic thread so strong that it can be heard scraping against solid objects and even seen occasionally. Yet it does not exist as a physical reality, for the space between the fingers and the object may be cut without severing the connection. Now these psychic threads are woven not of a physical but of etheric or astral matter. And as we do not know as yet how to mold or manipulate this accurately, we have to do the best we can by the power of the human will. The process to be followed, therefore, is first, vivid imaginary construction of these rays or threads, second, projection of the vital fluid, and third, the weaving of this together into the rigid rays by an effort of will. If the student can follow this process and persistently carry out the instructions, he will doubtless succeed in time in moving small, light objects, 
that is, if he is at all gifted with this phase of mediumship. How to construct the vital threads of rigid rays. The details of this process may now be given. First of all, place yourself in a relaxed, restful condition. Then think intently of the threads or rays which you wish to produce. Imagine these just like any other threads coming from your fingertips and becoming more and more dense and solid as they emerge. Think of the strips of fluid you saw between your fingertips in trying the experiments mentioned in Chapter 25, devoted to the human fluid. When you have formed these vital rays clearly in your mind and have them all ready to project, so to say, extend the fingers and by a strong effort of will, endeavor to project this energy into the space beyond the fingertips. After a very few trials, you will doubtless begin to do so. This you will feel in the form of pins and needles sensations in the fingertips. They will also get warm, perhaps perspire. When this second stage has been reached, you are ready to proceed with the third. The fluid thus projected is not in the form of rigid rays or threads, but rather a vaporous mass, a soft cloud, if the term be allowed, and you must toughen and strengthen this by willpower. After the projection has taken place, think and will intently that this shall happen, and this happening, and at the same time imagine your consciousness in your fingertips themselves molding and toughening these vital rays. If you do this, you will surely succeed in time, provided you go at the exercise in the right manner and stick to it persistently. Transferring the Power When the student has progressed thus far, the final step must be taken namely the transferring of this power to the control of a spirit or outside intelligence. This is a very delicate and subtle process, which is very little understood even by mediums. The best process is gradually to develop the power of going into trance coincidentally with the development of these physical phenomena. Once you have gained the power of projecting your fluid at will and moving material objects by its aid, which is probably attained by an extreme effort of will, you should endeavor to hand over this manipulative power to another intelligence. You cannot do this consciously, so you can only hope that the transference will take place when you have passed into trance. You should endeavor, therefore, to pass into trance while actually conducting the above-mentioned experiments, and the proof of the fact that this transference does take place is found in the fact that the most striking physical phenomena at a seance always occurs when the medium is in deep trance. The deeper the trance, the better the phenomena. In other words, the more the medium's will is in abeyance, the more opportunity is there given to the external will of the spirit to become active and bring about the required results. This fact is very strikingly proved by nearly all the best physical mediums in the history of spiritualism. Gathering Vital Energy from the Circle If you are unable to move material objects alone, you may perhaps be enabled to do so after gathering strength from others. You may do this either by forming a chain and gathering this energy by an effort of will before you make your experiment, or by placing your hands in position and asking the two members of the chain nearest to you to place their hands upon your temples, or one on your forehead, and the other over the solar plexus. In this way, a vital magnetic current is established which may greatly add to your powers and enable you to move objects and produce phenomena where you would otherwise fail. End of chapter 38. Recording by Alex Caraz. Chapter 39 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Caraz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter 39 Spirit and Thought Photography Spirit photographs are based on the belief that there is a spiritual body resembling in appearance the physical body, which is sufficiently solid to be photographed by means of the camera and sensitive plates. Usually more than this is necessary, namely the presence of a medium or psychic, possessing the peculiar power of rendering the spiritual body apparent to the camera. The medium seems to act as a sort of connecting link or intermediary between the body and the photographic plate, though the exact nature of the mediumistic influence is as yet unknown. Here is a field for study by expert photographers and by scientists to ascertain its limits and extent. How Spirit Photography is Possible 
To many, it may appear incredible that any spiritual body is sufficiently material to be photographed by the camera, for it would mean that this body is capable of reflecting light waves, this being the primary necessity in obtaining photographs at all. Yet, as Sir Oliver Lodge has pointed out, there is hardly anything more incredible in this than in taking the photograph of the reflection of an object in the mirror, which is quite possible. In this case, there is no solid object photographed, merely the reflected light waves which are themselves intangible and invisible. We know from experiment that the photographic camera is far more sensitive than the human eye. Physicians tell us that it is possible to photograph an eruption on the body before it actually occurs, that is, before it is visible to us, such as smallpox. On the other hand, it is also possible to photograph thousands of stars in the heavens which are invisible to the eye, even with the most powerful telescope. A photographic plate can therefore detect objects insensible to the eye, and hence it is reasonable to suppose, insomuch as spiritual bodies doubtless exist, but are just beyond the range of our vision, that the camera should be quite able to detect them, and spirit photographs are the result. Two sources of error and how to guard against them. In obtaining spirit photographs, you must be on your guard against two possible sources of error. The first is that you are liable to see faces and likenesses in the photographs which do not really exist at all. You construct them in imagination as you would faces in a coal fire. The second danger to be avoided if you are dealing with a professional spirit photographer is that of fraud. There has doubtless been much trickery in this department in the past and if you wish to be sure that you are not victimized you should take your own plates with you, see them inserted in the camera and watch their development after the picture has been taken. Even in this case, you are liable to be imposed upon unless you are very careful. How to begin your development The most satisfactory course to pursue is to experiment yourself and not depend upon a professional spirit photographer for your results. If you are at all sensitive and persevering, you will doubtless obtain genuine spirit photographs at the end of a certain period of time. Many hundreds of persons have done so, and there is no reason why you should not, if you are determined to obtain them. The best method is to sit privately with a friend of yours who is both sympathetic and more or less mediumistic and hold a short seance, seated at the table before you begin your experiments in photography. If you obtain messages by means of tippings of the table, raps, automatic writing, etc., so much the better. And if intelligent communication is thus established, ask your spirit friends to appear for you on the plate when the experiments are being held. They may promise to do so, but fail to appear. Do not be discouraged by this, as they may be perfectly willing to help you, but for some reason or another are unable to make their forms visible on the photographic plate. If you persist, however, you will doubtless obtain interesting results in a short time. How to take the photographs. After this preliminary seance, you should seat your subject in a chair against a dark background and focus the camera as you would were you taking this picture in the ordinary way. The photographic plate should, if possible, be held by both of you between your hands in the dark room before being inserted in the camera so as to get it impregnated with your magnetism. After he has taken up his position and the camera is properly focused, you should then ask your spirit friends to come and appear on the plate if possible. Do not exercise your will, however, nor think of any special object in particular, nor any person, but make your mind negative. If positive, you are quite likely to obtain thought photographs instead. Ask your invisible helpers to give you some sign, if possible, such as three raps when they are ready to appear, etc. If you obtain these, take the picture at once. If not, sit until you get into the requisite mental condition, then take the photograph and afterwards develop it carefully. It is improbable that you will obtain any definite results for the first few experiments, but many do even from the start, and this is doubtless one of the most promising of all the fields of psychic investigation for the student to enter. Radiographs and how to obtain them. The next thing to do is to endeavor to secure photographs of the rays or aura of the human body. These impressions on the photographic plate are secured comparatively rarely for the reason that the body of the subject must become radioactive to some extent before an impression of this kind is possible. Such pictures are consequently called radiographs, and a number of these have been obtained by Dr. Chorovich of Poland. The rays in question, 
which impress the photographic plates in such cases seem to emanate from the etheric double and not from the physical body, for the reason that they do not follow the anatomical distribution of the nerves of the body. The double, detached after the manner described in chapter 26, can often affect the plates in this way, and spirits can do so, but it is not common for the human body to be able thus to affect them. How to Obtain Thought Photographs The third and most interesting phase, in a sense, for the experimenter is that of thought photography. The most sensitive plates that can be procured should be used for this purpose and the experiment conducted in the dark, as indeed should the radiograph experiments. The plate may be held between the palms of the hands or placed against the forehead or over the solar plexus next to the skin and must be left there for a considerable time, half an hour or longer, if possible. During this time, the subject should think intensely of a certain figure or object, such as a cat, a chair, a ship, as the case may be. He should keep this before his mind vividly and intensely and never allow it to become blurred or indistinct. Holding it there by an effort of will, he should next endeavor to impress this upon the photographic plate and should also try to feel inwardly the process going on within him, the flow of the magnetic current to the spot beneath the plate, etc. Another way to produce thought photographs. Another way of obtaining thought photographs is to place a plate wrapped in black paper or placed in an opaque black envelope on the table and over it place the fingertips for some time, usually from five to 10 minutes. Then think or will that a certain thought or image will be impressed upon the plate. And if you are at all developed along this line, the impress will be left on the plate through the paper. Any object can be selected, a round ring of light, a triangle, a face, etc. It is best to begin with simple objects because the mind seems to be able to impress this upon the plate more readily and clearly than a more complex object, of which it cannot form so clear an outline. You must not be disappointed if you do not succeed at first in this, and you may have to develop, and thus spoil, a number of plates before you get any impression at all upon them. The first thing you will get, probably, will be a spot of light, or a series of small spots, as the fluid finds its way through the opaque paper onto the plate. You must remember that the human fluid is the instrument or intermediary through which photographs of this character are made, and hence you must learn the art of the projection of this fluid, as outlined in the chapter devoted to physical phenomena, before you can hope successfully to impress a photographic plate. Once you have done so, the rest will be simply a matter of development, and you will find it one of the most interesting and fascinating subjects for the investigation in the whole realm of psychics. Photographs of Psychic Forms and Emotions in many cases, photographs of emotions have been successfully taken, especially of late, and Monsieur Doguet has narrated a number of experiments of this character to the French Academy of Sciences, which has accepted his report as authentic. It is thus evident that thought photography has at length claimed a place in the scientific world, and this being so, it is only a matter of careful experimenting on the student's part before he obtains photographs of his character. An interesting series of experiments might be tried by the scientifically minded inquirer, namely to obtain photographs of mediums in trance, while they are obtaining automatic writing, crystal gazing, etc., and also of those who are on the point of dying. Such experiments would doubtless reveal many changes in the aura, and also the presence of thought images and possibly spirit forms, which would otherwise be quite unsuspected by those present. End of chapter 39. Recording by Alex Karaz. Chapter 40 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Karaz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. By Harroward Carrington. Chapter 40 Materialization. Materialization means the process of rendering solid or material, for a longer or shorter time, bodies through which disembodied spirits may function and communicate. 
Materialization usually occurs at seances in which a group of people are gathered together, and rarely or never when the medium is alone. The reason for this is probably that the necessary conditions are lacking, these being chiefly the lack of sufficient vital energy, which is drawn from the circle by the medium and utilized for the purposes of materialization. The Marvels of Materialization Many factors play a part in this mysterious phenomenon. Considered from the physical or material point of view, there is the reality of the phantom, and from the psychological or mental point of view, there is the mind of the materialized entity to account for. If we were always sure that the materialized figure were really the person it claimed to be, this latter difficulty would be overcome. But as we shall see later, there are many objections to the simple view of the case in all instances, and thus the problem is rendered more complex. From the purely physical point of view, the phenomena of materialization are the most baffling and the most mysterious in the whole realm of spiritualism. A few minutes before, nothing existed in the cabinet save the entranced medium. Now, there is a solid, tangible form possessing all the properties and appearances of matter, often having solid flesh and bones just as a human being would, the flesh being warm and lifelike, the hand possessing nails, hair, etc., like an ordinary hand, and being apparently composed of cells and tissues such as any material body would be composed of. How account for this? It is surely one of the most bewildering and incredible facts in nature. The Necessary Factors to Ensure Success From the point of view of spiritualism and psychic development, many factors play a part. There is first of all the physical body of the medium, secondly his vital magnetism, thirdly the magnetism of the sitters forming the circle, fourthly magnetism from disembodied spirits which mingle together and help to create the phantoms that appear at seances. The vital energy which seems to be drawn from the circle and chiefly from the medium during the seances is utilized or manipulated by the disembodied spirits who build up by its aid the materialized form we see before us. This is a very difficult and complicated process and not all spirits are competent to do this. For this purpose, what are known as spirit chemists are often employed, those who possess the knowledge of how to build up these forms. In the deepest stages of trance, when the medium is unconscious, the communication through materialized figures becomes clearer and clearer and the forms more dense and material. This is true of many psychic phenomena. The deeper the trance, the better the results obtained. Etherealization and Transfiguration In the lighter stages of trance, however, only portions of the figure may develop, such as hands, faces, etc., or very shadowy and vaguely defined outlines of human forms. These latter are not, strictly speaking, materialized, but are known as etherealized forms. They are less solid than the materialized figures, and it is often possible to pass the hand and arm through one of these figures without disturbing it. In the case of the materialized figure, on the other hand, they are just as solid and tangible as human form, and it would be impossible to make any other solid object pass through any part of them. In many cases, the physical body of the medium is more or less altered by the spirits without any other phantom being created. Such cases are known as transfiguration. When the figure created at the seance is not dense and fully formed, it does not possess either a complete or matured intelligence. It is not all there, so to speak, mentally or physically. How some forms are created. There is evidence to show that many of these forms are created by the will of the medium or by discarnate spirits, and that they are more truly thought forms than materialized spirits. Again, many of these figures are doubles or astral bodies belonging to living people who happen to appear at the seance or projections from discarnate spirits. In such case, the intelligence manipulating the phantom is not that of a mature spirit, but is a creation, so to speak, elaborated by the subconscious thoughts of the medium or by the mentality of the sitters forming the circle. The psychic atmosphere created by the minds in this circle has, in other words, produced the mind of the phantom in the same way that the combined vital magnetism of the sitters has produced the material body of the apparition. How Materialization is Accomplished The process of materialization seems to be somewhat as follows. 
the vital energy being drawn from the sitters into the body of the medium, the latter projects it outward into space. Together with a large portion of his own vital energy, or it is drawn out by the operating intelligences. When in space, at a short distance from the medium's body, this vital energy is molded, so to say, into the shape of the materialized form. It is built up or created by the operating intelligences. Between this form and the medium's physical body, there exists a subtle connection, or rapport, which has been described as a thread or bond of union. Though it is not a physical connection of any kind, or one that has ever been detected. Yet, that such a connection exists is proved by the phenomena of repercussion referred to in chapter 36, where it is shown that any injury done to the projected form reacted upon the body of the medium and left its mark upon it, just as though the physical form had suffered the injury. This is one of the most striking phenomena in the whole realm of spiritualism, and a case of this character is thus vividly described by the Venerable Archdeacon Kali in his address on spiritualism before the Church Congress which met in October 1905 and subsequently published by him in pamphlet form. He then said, He, the material phantom, seemed to be interested in everything around him, walked up and down the room, taking up various articles to examine them as would be natural to one of ancient race now in the midst of modern environment. Presently he espied and brought from the sideboard a dish of baked apples, and I got him to eat some. Our medium was at this time six or seven feet away from the spirit form, and had not chosen to take any of the fruit, asserting that he could taste the apple the Egyptian was eating. Wondering how this could be, I with my right hand gave our abnormal friend another apple to eat, holding a bit of white paper in my left hand outstretched toward the medium, when from his lips fell the chewed skin and core of the apple eaten by the Mahidi. Here it is before me now, after all these years, and this screwed up bit of paper for any scientist to analyze. In this instance, the phenomena of repercussion was very interestingly demonstrated. The method of the materialization of the figure was thus described by Archdeacon Kali in his lecture. How the figures are formed when, in expectation of a materialization, there was seen steaming, as from a kettle spout, through the texture and substance of the medium's black coat, a little below the left breast toward the side, a vaporous filament, which was almost invisible until within an inch or two of our friend's body. Then it grew in density to a cloudy something. There would then step forth timidly a figure, as did this little maiden. She was naturally a companion for others of our frequent psychic visitors. For as a cloud received one out of their sight, when the disciples at Bethany gazed on their ascending Lord, so as from a cloud thus inexplicably evolved from the medium, came our materialized friends, and vanished again to invisibility in a cloud, sucked back within his own body, when they were withdrawn from us, wistfully gazing on the mysterious departure and noting this or that particular phase of it within a few inches of the point of their inscrutable disappearance and the vanishment. The Clothes of Materialized Figures The question is often asked, how is it possible for spirits to become clothed? The old question of the clothes of ghosts being often raised among materialistic skeptics of the last century. The same question might be raised against the clothes of materialized figures but there is a ready answer to this which fully explains it. Those who deny and ridicule the possibility of materialization of remnant, as well as bodies, might ask themselves the question, whence came the clothing which Christ wore after his resurrection? For we are distinctly told that the master's raiment had been parted among the Roman soldiery, and upon his cloak had they cast lots. This historical incident furnishes us with an illustration of the case in point and the reality of this fact is amply borne out by many modern instances of a like character. How to begin your development In sitting for materialization, the medium should sit inside the cabinet, which should not be too large, so as to concentrate and focus the energy obtained from the circle. The medium should sit on a cane-bottomed chair, sufficiently comfortable to afford perfect relaxation when the trance supervenes. How to begin your development in sitting for materialization, the medium should sit inside the cabinet, 
which should not be too large so as to concentrate and focus the energy obtained from the circle. The medium should sit on a cane bottom chair sufficiently comfortable to afford perfect relaxation when the trance supervenes. At first the medium should hold the hands of those in the circle, but after a time these may be released. The light should be almost totally extinguished for reasons given before in this book. It must be remembered that there are all kinds of light, visible and invisible. We also have infrared rays and ultraviolet rays, the former being below the lowest form of visible vibration and the latter above the highest. It is because red is so low on the scale of vibration that mediums employ it during the seance. Photographs may be taken by infrared and ultraviolet light. Light has a very disintegrating effect on these subtle forms and would doubtless serve to disintegrate many of the materialized forms upon their initial appearance. The medium should make his mind as blank as possible, holding only the central idea of self, and mentally call upon his spirit friends to help in the production of phenomena. Early Signs and Phenomena Among the initial sensations which the medium will experience are probably flashes of heat and cold, blackness before the eyes, in which possibly there may be specks of light dancing hither and thither, and a cobwebby sensation over the hands and face which is almost invariable and very noticeable. Madame d'Esperance, a materializing medium of international fame, has stated that in her experience this cobwebby sensation was present on practically every occasion. Speaking of the phenomena and symptoms of the process, she says, If a few persons have gathered together in a half-darkened room, the emanations from their bodies can be seen by many, not necessarily clairvoyance. It appears as a slightly luminous haze about the head, shoulders, and sometimes the knees and feet. Frequently it gathers slowly at the fingers, increasing in density until it resembles a slight transparent film of slightly luminous cotton wool. This is often perceptible to the eyes of all, but it offers no resistance to the touch. By some force of attraction, either inherent or exerted upon it by some outside agency, this mass appears to mingle and draw together to become more dense and at this stage has been found to be decidedly receptible to the touch. It resembles as nearly as can be described the gossamer web seen on trees and bushes on an early summer morning. The sensation of cobwebs and what it means. Many persons in a materialization seance are sensible of a feeling as of cobwebs being on their faces and hands. I have myself not only felt the sensation but when brushing my face or hands have distinctly felt what seemed to be fine filaments of the gossamer which clung to my fingers. The attention of the sitters has been frequently drawn to this almost impalpable substance which has vanished as soon as the light has been brought near it. This emanation from the sitters in a seance is generally, if not always, accompanied by a sensation of chill or draft, similar to that felt by a person in a slightly feverish condition. The head will be hot, there will be a heavy throbbing in the temples. The hands, feet, and other parts of the body will be cold to the touch. The medium, by the exercise of his will, can at any time prevent manifestations. In fact, the opposition of any person in a circle will act as a hindrance to the work of the unseen operators. Why some forms resemble the medium. As a rule, when full materializations are accomplished, the medium is entranced so deeply that he cannot remember the process of the production of the forms. In the earlier stages of trance, the mind should be concentrated on the creation of forms of this character, but after it has reached a certain stage, you may safely turn over the process to your spirit friends. In some instances, the medium's double becomes detached from the body and appears to those forming the circle as a materialized figure, though it is not such in reality. If such a figure be photographed or closely examined, the striking resemblance to the medium is easily seen, though it is not the medium who may be seen entranced within the cabinet. Lack of knowledge of this fact has given rise to the false belief that in cases of this character, the medium himself was consciously personating the spirit, but the true explanation is that the double has been liberated during the seance and has thus appeared to the sitters as an independent being. The phenomena of materialization, as before said, are amongst the most interesting in the whole realm of the supernormal, and will well repay careful study and the prolonged experimentation on the part of the student. End of chapter 40. Recording by Alex Caraz.
Chapter 41 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter 41 Advanced Studies. The subject matter and advice contained in the present chapter is advanced only for those who have carefully read through and practiced the preceding chapters of this book. Those who have not done so are strongly advised not to undertake some of the experiments herein described unless they have carefully carried out the instructions contained in the earlier chapters, and particularly the warnings herein given these advanced studies are suitable only for those students who have succeeded in attaining a certain mastery of the inner self and who have developed a certain amount of psychic force or power which is under their own control in a certain sense they may be considered more or less dangerous but they are not so to one who has progressed sufficiently to be in a position to follow them Progress is necessary in psychic development as in every other field of endeavor, and those who have gone thus far should try to advance their powers and faculties yet another step forward into that vast and mystic beyond, which encircles us on every side, not only in the life to come, but here and now. Cultivating the Sixth Sense The first thing for the student to do is to cultivate, as far as possible, his sixth sense already mentioned briefly in chapter nineteen devoted to the cultivation of sensitiveness this sixth sense is a general feeling of awareness of surrounding powers and entities a knowledge which is not dependent on any of the five senses some of the preliminary exercises for cultivating this sense have already been given and we shall now proceed to give a few more leading the student yet further along the path to self-realization and power he should first of all begin with deep breathing exercises accompanied by certain psychical processes and practices the process of taking the complete breath has already been described in chapter six and while the student is in the relaxed condition previously mentioned he should concentrate his mind and carry out the following psychic formula psychic breathing exercises breathe rhythmically until the rhythm is perfectly established then inhaling and exhaling form the mental image of the breath being drawn up through the bones of the legs and then forced out through them then through the bones of the arms then the top of the skull then through the stomach then through the reproductive region then as if it were traveling upward and downward along the spinal column and then as if the breath were being inhaled and exhaled through every pore of the skin the whole body being filled with prana vital energy or life and breathing rhythmically send the current or prana to the seven vital centers in turn as follows using the same mental picture as in the previous exercises first to the very end of the spinal cord second to the reproductive region next to the center of the abdomen next to the solar plexus then to the heart then to the throat then to a spot between the eyes low down on the forehead finally to a spot at the very top of the brain finish by sweeping the current of prana to and fro from head to foot several times how to awaken the chakras or seven vital centers these seven vital centers in the body are known as chakras and have very great interest and importance in all higher psychic development and in all occult practice it is upon the awakening of these seven centers in fact that all the higher clairvoyance and psychical faculties depend they are supposed to be the links of connection between the physical and the astral bodies and if they are not awakened in precisely the right order and in the right manner grave difficulties may result while on the other hand if they are awakened correctly the student who has done so is instantly gifted with extraordinary clairvoyant and higher psychical faculties enabling him not only to see the past and the future but also all those spiritual beings who are constantly around him 
the thoughts and emotions of others pictures of their past lives etc in other words much depends upon the awakening of these centers in eastern philosophy they are symbolized as lotus flowers and the highest and last in the brain is called the thousand and one petaled lotus importance of awakening in the right order the vital energy which passes upward through these centers is symbolized as a fiery serpent which in passing upward animates each in turn and wakes them into activity and it is highly important that this current of energy should pass through each center in the right order as before said the sensation of warmth and a faint prickling as of pins and needles is felt at the moment of awakening each of these centers in sanskrit the word kundalini literally meaning the coiled up is employed this serpent when fully aroused and activated leads not only to the awakening of the higher psychical faculties before mentioned but also to others of a still more startling character swami vivekananda in his lectures on raja yoga page ninety one gives the following psychical exercises which should be practiced in connection with this psychical unfoldment and development the sacred word om and meditation sit straight and look at the tip of your nose by controlling the two optic nerves one advances a long way towards the control of the arc of reaction and so to the control of the will imagine a lotus upon the top of the head several inches up and virtue as its center the stalk as knowledge the eight petals of the lotus are the eight powers of the yogi inside the stamens and pistils are renunciation inside of the lotus think of the golden one the almighty the intangible he whose name is om the inexpressible surrounded with effulgent light meditate on that think of a space in your heart and in the midst of that space think that a flame is burning think of that flame in your own soul and inside that flame in another space effulgent and that is the soul of your soul god meditate on that in the heart he who has given up all attachment all fear and all anger he who has taken refuge in the lord whose heart has become purified with whatsoever desire he comes to the lord he will grant that to him internal or spiritual respiration another valuable practice in connection with breathing is that which is known as internal or spiritual respiration the idea is based upon the belief that in addition to our physical lungs there are also spiritual lungs and that just as the physical lungs receive energy and are purified by the air we breathe so also are the spiritual lungs energized and filled by the power of spirit when accompanied by suitable psychical and mental processes the power of the word om so often repeated in eastern philosophy may be perceived faintly by any one pronouncing the word slowly several times in succession when it will be seen that it has a peculiar psychical effect upon the individual and that it sets up remarkable rhythmic vibrations throughout the whole being which become more and more noticeable as the word is repeated this is the most holy word of the vedas or sacred books of the east and its symbolic meaning is the supreme being the ocean of knowledge or bliss absolute seeing with any part of the body one other valuable exercise which should be practiced is that of seeing or endeavoring to see with any part of the body as though eyes were situated at any point upon which you concentrate your forces and that you were actually looking outward from that point this power has been cultivated to an extraordinary extent by some of the eastern adepts and is recorded as happening spontaneously now and then even now in the east the power is cultivated by an effort of attention coupled by will and should be preceded by the practice of traveling around the body in thought mentioned before in this book and then holding yourself consciously on one particular point in your circuit of the body and concentrating yourself on that point 
at this stage of your development you may begin to practice an exercise which would be of great benefit not only to yourself but to others also after you have fallen asleep and the astral body is thereby loosened from the physical body you should learn to make use of this astral body during the hours of sleep and send it on journeys to help those who may be in need of this help you may after a certain amount of effort thus project the astral body and cause it to retain full self-consciousness when this has been acquired this projected body can assist those who have recently died comforting and consoling them and can carry messages from such a person to those still living it can assist those in danger and help along humanity in a thousand different ways when you have learned to project your astral body in this manner during sleep you are known as one of the invisible helpers and many persons are said to make it a business to perform at least one good action every night during sleep the development of cosmic consciousness two remarkable psychical manifestations will result from these spiritual practices if correctly and carefully performed the first is the enlargement of the self until it attains a vast area so to speak which has been called cosmic consciousness by those who have experienced it this consciousness is a step higher than human consciousness just as the human is a step higher than the animal and enables us to perceive truth and spiritual reality behind the universe in addition to stimulating remarkable psychic powers such realities as the fourth dimension which are usually quite incapable of being appreciated by our finite senses are said to be clear and intelligible to those who possess cosmic consciousness and the connection between spirit and matter is also clear to them power over animate and inanimate matter the second remarkable development from the awakening of these higher spiritual faculties will be the greater power you possess over animate and inanimate nature you will find that you exert a peculiar influence over all animals with whom you come into contact and that they not only know and understand you but if the animals are wild they will not harm you in any way it is stated that many of the yogis of india can walk uninjured through dense jungles filled with tigers and venomous snakes these facts throw a new and interesting light upon the account of daniel in the den of lions doubtless all the biblical narratives of this kind can be rationally accounted for when we have acquired sufficient knowledge of psychic and spiritual science even the case of the three men who were cast into the fiery furnace and escaped uninjured several mediums have done the same thing on a small scale sir william crookes has reported that he has seen the medium d d holm extract red-hot coals from the fire and hold them in his hands without injury similarly the magicians or witch doctors of many of the savage tribes can walk over glowing coals or red-hot embers without being burned after they have undergone certain religious rites and preparations in addition to this you will have increased power over inorganic matter so that you can move objects without contact with comparative ease and cause phenomenal changes to take place in those objects you will find that you have in an almost perfect degree the power of self-projection that you can leave your body and enter the astral plane at will exploring it and observing its denizens creation by the power of will finally you will be able actually to create by the power of your thought forms and objects which are external and apparently objective in other words you will have learned to create by the power of the will and this is one of the greatest achievements gained by the advanced student of the occult phantoms apparitions thought forms etc are created in this way it is impossible at this time to enter more deeply into these questions higher exercises of this kind to be explained fully as they should be would require a further course of study and it is my intention to follow the present work with a second one which will contain more detailed advice as to the development of the higher psychical and spiritual faculties for the present i must leave the psychic student here at the end of his preparatory studies 
wishing him success in his efforts in the attainment of psychic power if the student will but follow the directions contained in the present work carefully and at the same time pay due attention to the advice contained therein he will be enabled to develop his psychic powers to a very great extent and will thereby be fitted to undertake still more advanced studies which will be taken up very fully in a subsequent work the end end of chapter forty one advanced studies recording by pamela Krantz. end of your psychic powers and how to develop them 